Okay, thank you. I'm sorry for that lapse as we started. Just for the general public information, we've called the meeting to order. We have already voted the sewer and water rates for next year, beginning July 1st, 2019. We are now moving on to general public comment. When you come forward for general public comment, please make sure that you sign the form that's on the table. Make sure you speak your name and your address, making sure that you are, in fact, a resident of Amherst. You'll have no more than three minutes to speak. The issues that we will have public comment on later are 7A, 7B, 7C, 7D, and 7F. We will not have public comment on other items, and you are welcome to speak in public comment to any other issue not on our, on our agenda tonight. May I see a hand of those people wishing to make public comment? Okay, would you please come forward? Make sure the mic is on. Thank you, Dylan. My name is Dylan Maxfield. I live at uh, 290 North Pleasant Street, apartment two in Amherst, Massachusetts. Uh, I'm here to comment on the way the town uh, council handles board appointments, such as those for the Zoning Board of Appeals, as well as the Planning Board, specifically on whether or not it makes public information of who is not appointed to those boards. And I'm here to give comment in favor of making that a public record. Uh, the reason I believe this was in my own personal experience, I had applied to be on the licensing commission. And I had applied with, I believe, 10 applicants in total for five spots. Um, I was somebody who lives in the downtown right across the street from where Porta is and uh, the spoke. I'm affected by the noise in the bars. I'm somebody who's worked in the bars in town. I have that perspective of what bars violate what laws and why they do it. And I'm somebody who, from time to time, goes to the bars myself and knows what the experience is as a patron, as an employee, and as a resident in town. And when I'd applied for the board, I had ended up being denied, and I had figured a lot of people had applied. There must have been someone with a similar perspective. There's no need to double up on that. But what I'd seen was a series of professors being appointed, lawyers, and a former select board member. And I understand that the licensing commission doesn't fall under the purview of the council, but if you look at the something as the planning board, the zoning board of appeals, you'll see that same trend continue. Who you see being appointed are lawyers, professors, landlords, and uh, business owners who are serving in our community on these boards. And I can't help but wonder, are working class people like myself applying for these boards and are being denied and we're only accepting lawyers, professors, and the college educated? Are these the only people who we want serving in our town? And to that question, are working class people being denied? The answer I have to give is, I don't know. It's not public information. We don't know. And I strongly believe that the council, when it wants to make that choice of whether or not to keep that information concealed or whether to keep it open to the public, I believe it's very important to keep that information open to the public. Because I believe if we want to have our community government represented by members of the community from all walks of life and all income levels, it needs to be public information, not only who's being appointed, obviously, but who is being denied. Is there a trend of people of working class being turned away from these uh, community boards? So I believe it is very important that going forward, we do keep that um, information open to, to the public so we can better address that issue, if that issue is even there. Because at this point, I simply have to say, I just don't know who is being turned away. And I hope that this is something that the council would consider to be an important issue as well. Thank you so much. Thank you for your comment. Are there any of the public comments at this time? OK, then proceeding with our agenda. Uh, we have a proclamation for the Juneteenth proclamation. And I understand we have someone in the audience who would like to speak to this. Please come forward. On the 19th of June, 1865. Thank you. On the 19th of June, 1865, uh, general order number three. I, excuse me, I'm going to ask, interrupt you, Kalmakar. Yes. 
Could you please state your name? I'm sorry. Milkar Shabazz, 29 Chapel Road. And the people that are with you? Edward Cage, 12 Longmeadow Drive. Hosea Shabazz, uh, 29 Chapel Road as well. Milkar Shabazz, second, uh, 29 Chapel Road. Great. These Thank have you. all been um, involved in celebrating Juneteenth for the past nine years. And uh, this year we will do the same with your passage of this proclamation. It will engage the entire town with us uh, on the steps tomorrow, I mean Wednesday rather, at 4 p.m. Um, where we will both read out the general order number three that Major General Granger read in the last state to be informed of the end of slavery, Texas. In, on June 19, 1865. <laughs> we will go from there uh, after the bells are rung, um, again with your permission, to um, Jones Library where we'll have uh, a program there in the remainder of the evening. Okay, would you like someone from the council to be there to read the proclamation? That would be splendid, I'd love that. Thank you. We invite any and all that can come. Okay, any other comments from the rest of you at this time? <coughs> Okay. Yes. I, I just want to say Pat. Um, I'm absolutely in favor of this proclamation. Um, I want to say that one of the things that the town of Amherst needs to do is to begin to look at um, systemic and structural racism in our community. And so we do this proclamation, I do it with joy, but knowing that we're not requiring any changes. And so how do we work together as a community to really address white supremacy and, our, and the culture that controls us? Are there any other comments from the counselors at this time? Okay, then with a show of hands, here is the motion. Um, I move to adopt the Juneteenth proclamation as presented and amended, or as presented, period. All those in favor? Oh, I, I, that's a motion. Is there a second? I second it. Thank you. And all those in favor? Aye. Raise your hands, aye. And that is t opposed, abstain, and one absent. So it's 12 zero, zero, and one absent. And I hope that other counselors can join me at four o'clock on Wednesday and join you as well. Thank you so much. We're now going to move into the proposed zoning bylaws. And let me just give a little history. First of all, this is a first reading. When we do any bylaw changes, uh, you have to have two readings, and in between that, you have to have a hearing. We will do that hearing on July 1st. I also want to recognize several people who have worked very hard on this. One of them is Mr. Ritchie, Attorney Ritchie, just sitting right here in front of us. Not only has he chaired this bylaw review committee, but he, by he chaired the one that preceded this prior to the council being seated along with uh, Bernie Kubiak, and then counselors Alyssa Brewer, Pat DeAngelis, and Evan Ross, and with their staff of Jeff Kravitz, and obviously, Christine, you're here as well. And I, I also wanna mention that this is not, these are not major bylaw changes that are structurally going to change anything at this point but they are very important because we needed to do some housekeeping. Many of our bylaws referred to select board and things like that. But having said that, I'm going to leave the rest up to our esteemed chair and please proceed. Well, thank you for the opportunity to come back and visit with you again on this very interesting uh, uh, event. Uh, I read recently that uh, the ending of every story is just the beginning of another. And this is a chapter in the storybook. And uh, what, what you have before you tonight is a proposal to basically deal with the zoning bylaws. Uh, the committee that, uh, that I chaired, both committees, uh, were charged with taking a look at that, reviewing them, 
and fashioning uh, our, our thoughts and suggestions on uh, how the repeal and uh, replacement should, uh, should be accomplished. So just to, 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 to put into the context of what you have before you tonight and the next couple of weeks, uh, there is a document that, uh, that was generated by the committee uh, that has been shared by, with the planning board and, and the council and the council elect. And it represents the zoning bylaw uh, in, uh, in a format that was uh, written in Word, but it was track changes so that all of the revisions and attentions we gave to the text of the zoning bylaw are evident from reading it in that context. Uh, at, at a point down the road, I think on July 1st, the council will, uh, if things go according to the, the, the plan, uh, will have before it uh, a motion to actually vote to make that change. Uh, so the, the, uh, the document uh, before you represents the work of the committee. Uh, and just to review some of the background for it, the, the charter uh, uh, basically uh, in, in 2.1 uh, char ch charges the, the, the council with, uh, with making these changes. Uh, it is important to note that all of the changes uh, that we're proposing for you now with zoning and sometime down the road with the general bylaws of the town, uh, leave the bylaws that were adopted by the town of Amherst, by town meetings uh, in, in the past, continue in full force and effect until the action taken by this council. That was in 10.1 of the charter that, uh, that gave that. Until the bylaws of the town were amended, repealed, uh, uh, altered, then they, they are the, the, the laws of the town. So on November of 2018, the zoning bylaw was in a form that continues in full force and effect to this day. And it will stay the law uh, uh, right through the date of the, uh, the vote of the council to, to repeal and replace. Um, the world didn't come to an end when the, when the form of government changed because the charter and the state laws recognized the necessity of a town that becomes a, a, a city form of government to interpret the bylaws of the town in a practical and reasonable way. So uh, we're addressing the zoning bylaws first because having reviewed them over a period of 30 meetings in the first meeting and, uh, committee and uh, many meetings of the second committee, uh, we, uh, we, we have uh, seen the evident distinction between general bylaws and zoning bylaws. Zoning bylaws are, are a single, unified, integrated, large, complex bit of law that have a, a, a plan of organization that required very little attention of our committee. Uh, in addressing the, charter, uh, the changes to that uh, zoning bylaw, mandated by the Charter, they were relatively few in number because the, the, the primary level of attention given by the committee was to make those changes that compelled attention to whether it was an executive, legislative, or administrative function. Changing select board to council or town manager to council or other uh, the designations of uh, boards and officials. So that first level of attention uh, to the zoning bylaw was relatively simple. Uh, with, the with the general bylaws, on the other hand, it was a complicated bit of business because unlike the zoning bylaws, general bylaws were a collection of laws passed at various times by various town meetings with no organizing principle of, of alphanumeric organization. And so the, the attentions of the committee were, for that reason, uh, almost exclusively focused on the general bylaws. And those times that we did devote ourselves to the zoning bylaws, we had the benefit of the collected wisdom of the planning staff, the planning board, uh, Chris, and, uh, and uh, the town attorney. So the document that is before you tonight in first reading basically is the zoning bylaw that was in effect in uh, November of 19, 2018 and continues unchanged in effect uh, today uh, with those changes that, are, uh, that, that have been explained to you. Um, the, the major focus of uh, attention to the general bylaws deal with such uh, remedial attentions to the text as uh, uh, not only changing the designations of public uh, uh, boards and officials, 
but introducing uh, a, a plan of attacking some of the graphic deficiencies such as gender neutrality, uh, replacing numerals for numbers, uh, maintaining some consistency from one general bylaw to another so that if a term is used, it has that same meaning throughout the code of, of general laws. These problems don't really affect the zoning bylaw. The zoning bylaw is a document that affects the property interests of everybody in town. It's an important document, and it deserves to be a matter of first attention by the council for that reason. Uh, the, the objective of a complete repeal and replacement is so that the date of codification is a clean break from the past, so that we have a, a baseline uh, zoning law that, that, that's, that is thereafter modified with respect to what the council does when it acts on July 1st, if it does. Uh, as distinct from going back and, uh, and revising and amending bylaws that have continued to be in effect, but from various points of time. It's like generating a, a, a code made out of whole cloth rather than a quilt of unrelated uh, document. Uh, in addition to the organization of the general bylaws, uh, they were not uh, inserted into a framework that had a coherent alphanumeric uh, order. So the committee has spent a good deal of time creating such a framework so that uh, the, the, the numbering scheme is, is organized. Uh, and references and captions and labels are all consistent. The general bylaws call for the re the repeal of a number of laws that no longer had an effect uh, in, in the new form of government. Uh, they were written at a time when the value of white space and readability was not a prominent objective of the legislation back then. So a lot of white space was introduced. Uh, clarity with respect to what we mean when we say something is a mandatory rather than uh, uh, voluntary. So the use of shall having that mandatory, we've always made sure we've said that the same way. Uh, we've eliminated in the general bylaws redundancy, where large clumps of text were repeated endlessly when some abbreviated form could possibly be used to substitute for that. So shorter sentences, more periods, more white space, uh, clearer, clearer organization, and probably the most dramatic change that we recommended for the general bylaws of it it is to a extract from the uh, dense text of the, of the bylaw all of those things having to do with the, the, uh, the fines and the penalties and the fees associated with it. So in the front of every new general bylaw, you will find a little data block with all of that relevant information so that the, the, anybody that reads it, a member of the general public, will e easily see what the consequences of violating the bylaw are. So all of that uh, time and attention that our committee has devoted to the general bylaws, we were mercifully relieved of having to do that with the zoning bylaws because they are well organized. Uh, you can't change one part, but you don't have ripple effects throughout the entire document. That is not true with general bylaws. So um, I, I, I don't know what more to say other than the fact that we've done our best to uh, keep the number of changes to an absolute minimum. Whereas with the general bylaws, we make numerous recommendations for change, some of which we were presumptuous enough to draft for your consideration. Others we embedded in, in uh, commentary that we offered to the council so that as you look at some of these continuing deficiencies, you have at least our list of the things that we think you should attack first. Again, we don't have that problem with the zoning bylaws. Uh, the changes that you have seen uh, basically uh, are the changes of the names of the bodies involved, uh, where, where it might have been the select board, uh, it is now the council or the manager, uh, depending on whether the function was uh, uh, legislative or executive in nature. Uh, in one instance, we clumped together, we aggregated uh, all of those bylaws that have to do generally with the topic of marijuana, which these days is a rather voluminous bit of uh, text. We've clustered those together into a one section of the zoning bylaw uh, so that the reader will go to one place to get all of the relevant, relevant information. 
we did this largely in consort with the, uh, the planning board and the planning staff so that these things are consistent with their thinking of, uh, uh, of how they will approach future changes to this baseline document uh, that you have, uh, have before you uh, tonight and the next uh, few weeks. Again, the, the, the mission that the committee uh, uh, felt itself responsive to was broken into two parts. The first part was to make recommendations for those changes that were mandated or absolutely necessitated by the charter. The other more flexible mission was to propose changes that fully implemented the charter uh, for our new form of government. Uh, the committee was, was invited to read that liberally and to come up with changes that we thought enhanced the value uh, of the document as a readable text that everybody can understand. It should be not readable only by lawyers and professionals. It should be uh, clear enough so that any member of the general public can pick it up and, and have a good idea of what it says. Uh, the general bylaw will have a section in the administrative uh, preamble with uh, an interpretive guide. When we say things, this is what we mean, so that there will be uh, some assist to those that read the document. I think that the, the zoning bylaw is much more difficult to understand. And I think at some point uh, we can bring some of these attentions that we've given to the general bylaws and apply those to the zoning bylaw going forward. But uh, since I think time is much more important on matters dealing with land use and property rights, uh, dealing with zoning is uh, appropriately the first bit of legislative business that our committee thinks appropriate for the council to act on. Um, I could go through some of the other changes, but as I say, they're so relatively few that uh, unless there are any questions uh, that you may have uh, that will clarify this further. Chris, did you? I just wanted to let you know, and I think you have a report from the planning board. The planning board held a, a public hearing on June 5th and voted, I believe it was six um, with one person absent to recommend That's these correct. changes to the town council. That's correct. Uh, two postscripts. Uh, there are places in the document, the, the, the document that was submitted to you back in November, which was uh, wonderfully put together by Jeff Kravitz uh, mm -hmm. on the, as staff to our committee. And it is the document that you will be looking at uh, on the day that you vote on this. Uh, by the first, the, the accept all changes button will be pressed and you will have a document that will represent the document that will be the zoning bylaws on July 5th or July 1st. Uh, there are a few things that need to be addressed between now and then. Internal cross-references to the general bylaws were drafted with, with, with a reference to the new framework of the general bylaws, which is not yet so. So I think the document that will be acted on by the council ought to keep references to the current old general bylaws for consistency. At some point, a technical change uh, uh, will be made to the zoning bylaws. Once the general bylaws have been changed, those cross-references will be fixed. Uh, there, is, uh, there are two other relatively small changes, one in which uh, the jurisdiction over streets was understood uh, to be, is understood to be a matter within the jurisdictional purview of the council not the town manager, so we made a change uh, that, is, that is different from the text that you had back in November. And I believe uh, Chris Brestrup indicated to me that there is another typographical change at the very beginning in which we have uh, the, the, uh, the appointment of members of the zoning board and the planning board. We're going to clean up the grammar and the syntax of a sentence, not to change the meaning, but to make the meaning clear that the appointment is it's, it's in section 10.1. Uh, there was a question that was brought up today that um, made it seem as if this language that's in this current text that you have before you um, makes it seem as if the associate members are also um, having three-year terms and the associate members only have one-year terms. So we have to clean up that language. Mm -hmm. So okay. those are the only changes that, that I'm aware of. Uh, but between now and the second reading and mm -hmm. action by the council, uh, we'll work with uh, Jeff Kravitz to make certain that the document is, 
is completely correct. Okay. So we'll start with questions from the council. Then this is an item for public comment. So are there questions from the council? Mandy Jo. Just, you just mentioned the, um, the, there was one change that dealt with the public ways keeper of the streets. Could you point me to exactly where that, you know, what article that might be yeah, in? Um, I think if you jump to the text, uh, 7.10, um, 7.104 uh, deals with uh, streets. 8.42 and 8.21 uh, both deal with signs. Um, and those, those references need to be changed to the current bylaw. But the one dealing with streets, I believe, is 7.104 on page 84 of the document. Just for the use of the public, you can find this online. It's 135 pages long. So we're not going to read it out loud tonight, nor are we going to show it all to you on the screen. I'll begin to read now. Yeah, <laughs> right. Mandy Jo, do you have a question? Okay. Are there other questions at this time? Yes, Kathy. Yeah, I had um, one just so I understand it. At the very beginning, when you talk about appointments to the Design Review Board, it talks about staggered three-year terms. And when we get to 10.1 for zoning and 10.02 for planning, it just says three-year terms. Are those terms also staggered? So it's a, it's a question of one has the adjective of staggered three-year terms and the other says just three-year terms. And I just checked the charter. There's no language on it. So I, I didn't know whether in practice they're staggered or whether both of them need what? Yep. So it's a question. Yes, please, Chris. In the past, there has been a practice of appointing people to stagger three-year terms. Um, and so when um, a new person is being appointed, if there's a term that hasn't been completely filled out and there are only two years left, that person would be appointed for that term. So I think in the, in the beginning, um, it's, it's hard to explain because in the beginning, everybody was appointed you know, initially. Um, but over time, people resign and new people come on, and so the intent is to have them appointed for staggered three-year terms. Although you might want to reconsider that because now we have um, seven members of the planning board rather than nine. So I think staggered three-year terms made sense with nine members. Perhaps that doesn't make sense with seven members, but the planning board doesn't have that um, doesn't have jurisdiction over that. So. It's maybe no, something that you want we to do. talk about. Thank you. Yes, Steve. The charter, section 2.9, says the town council shall appoint all members of the planning board and zoning board of appeals for staggered three-year terms. Okay. So we need to make sure that the final draft that we're looking at on July 1st is consistent in both places. Yeah. Okay. Yes, Alyssa. So I have actually several things because I spent several hours on this as a member of the bylaw review committee and I will try not to bore you with all of that. But I will say that I, a number of questions have arisen and one includes the fact that I'm not convinced that our bylaw needs to conform with our charter on that. Um, it didn't in the past. So our Old Town Government Act and the bylaw weren't matchy matchy on the staggered terms. So that's probably a legal question that's worth asking because we know now that we could do that. but. I'm not sure that it's necessarily necessary to do that to, because we have to look first at the bylaw. We have to look at the MGL. We have to look at the bylaw. We have to look at the charter. They don't all have to match for them to all apply. And so if we're trying to simplify our lives, it would make sense to have the match. But that means, so I, I'm just saying, that's not how it used to be. It didn't used to match. And so it was not a problem in the past, and I don't know if it's technically a problem now, although obviously the charter does say staggered. So that's important. There are a number of other issues going on here, and I don't want to misspeak, and I'm sure Chris will straighten me out or Bob if necessary. But one of the things we didn't realize until last week is that the charter says that there's a 14-day notice period that needs to take place for any bylaw change, whether it's zoning or 
general bylaws. We hadn't taken that into account when we were doing this, and I'm still not convinced we know that we all have a shared agreement on where that goes on the town bulletin board. Just like when we realized we had to do that for committee appointments, we said, eh, let's put it in news and announcements. That'll be a place everybody sees it. Um, but do we assume that 14 days notice means somebody has to know to go look in our packet? Does that mean it goes in news and announcements? I'm not sure we know where that goes or if that has taken place, and obviously our president will be able to speak to that. In terms of hearings, we don't have to have hearings on general bylaws. That's not a requirement of the law or of our charter, but we do on zoning, and that was also overlooked until last week. And so I appreciate all the scrambling everybody did to try and get those legal notices done. I'm also concerned that I realize we had to scramble at that point. But if those legal notices have been done for July 1st, we as a council need to know that there are legal notices in the newspaper about something we're planning to do mm -hmm. so that we know that as a group. And so we have to figure out a new, a, you know, a way of informing, right? Getting it done was the most important thing. But in future, because there will be continued zoning bylaw revisions that come to us, and so we'll need to find out, because I am quite confident that all 13 of you do not read the legal notices in the Gazette to know that it's coming up at a future meeting, and we don't have a list of what's coming up at future meetings either, and so I just don't like being caught out in front of the Jones Library and somebody asking me about a legal notice and I have no idea what they're talking about. So I, these are all just systems we have to figure out how to put in place because we're different now than we were as town meeting. We're different as a city than we were as a town. And so if those sound like different things than before, that's because it's true, they are different than before. And there's one slight misstatement in the planning board report which says that because of what happened in the fall, that because we didn't act within 90 days of the planning board hearing, that's not true. It's because we didn't act within 90 days of the public hearing by the city council because we didn't have a hearing. <laughs> so the action that needs to take place under Mass General Law is within 90 days of the town council hearing, not the planning board hearing for a city. However, that brings up another question about hearings, which is that in future, after we give them this nice, clean zoning bylaw that we're going to give over to the planning board, we could very well simplify our lives by having a joint hearing between the planning board and the, either the town council or the CRC of the town council so we wouldn't have to jump through quite so many hoops. Mm -hmm. so we missed that opportunity this time because planning board already did theirs, yay. Um, but we need to do one, but in future we may want to hold them at the same time just to kind of simplify everybody's life depending on what time of day makes sense for people and all that kind of thing. So those are just all things. What I would say is that we're still trying to work out all the systems for how this is gonna work, so it may look a little different to us next time we see it. And um, I appreciate that Chris and Jeff are actually working on some language to improve that inadvertent change in the wording that we didn't, we weren't trying to change it to associates being three years. We, that was just the way it got edited by someone at some point. And it does still say four associates. I don't think that's a problem, even though we only had just appointed three, because we could say it says up to four. So rather than saying, well, it's three because we picked three, we could leave it at up to four. But if any of you noticed that difference because we recently appointed CBA associates and we only appointed three of them, it's okay to have the bylaw say up to, up to four. Okay. Uh, first of all, we, let me just address a few things. We did discover this. We did put notice in. We will make sure that, that notice, a copy of that notice is forwarded to all counselors. Uh, it was, is a 14-day notice. The hearing, our first reading is tonight. Our second reading is on the 1st of July. At that point, we will actually start the meeting with a hearing, and that is the required hearing. And then after that, it's posted for 14 more days until such time as nobody else wants to comment, and then it's done. That's my understanding. Now, Margaret, would you please speak to anything else on that? The first legal notice was in today's Gazette. The second legal notice will be in on the 24th. So that's going to satisfy uh, Chapter 40A, Section 5. Uh, publication on the town's bulletin board, um, it's, a, it's a little ambiguous, but it, the entire proposed bylaw, both in clean copy and in markup, are in the agenda packets, and we're in the agenda packets for the council more than 14 days in advance of final approval. 
Um, and uh, the statute requires that notice of the public hearing be posted on a bulletin board in a conspicuous place um, in the town hall, and that is posted outside the town clerk's office, and that will meet the 14-day requirement as well. Okay. Yes, Mandy Jo. So I just want to clarify something you just said, Lynn. Um, once we vote, the extra 14 days is prior to taking effect because the charter allows has a 14-day window. It's not a requirement to be posted, but we vote if we vote to approve. They don't actually take effect for 14 days yep. because that is the time period during which uh, residents could obtain a whole bunch of signatures to try and do a veto of what we just passed. So they don't take effect until the end of that time period passes. But there's no other posting requirements or anything. Thank you. Yes, Dorothy. My question is about staggered three-year terms. Does that mean that when you appoint people, one of them is one year, one of them is two year, and one of them is three year? Or do you start them all new at three years and then assume that people will drop in and out and at some point it begins to be staggered? Chris. I really don't have an answer to that question because the term, uh, the appointments were always done by the town manager. And so I'm not exactly sure what thought process he went through. I think he had advice from the select board during that process, but um, I really wasn't privy to that. I, I will add to that. When, but when we approached the zoning final, we made it, our intention was to make as few changes to it as possible. So we read, we read the chocolate and, and made the changes to the point and left everything out for future attention. You know, steering clear of anything that had a policy dimension to it, we thought was outside of the. So further comment on that particular issue? Are there other questions? Shalini, I'm sorry, I didn't see you. I was just curious if there were any instances where there was any doubt about who the authority should be, you know, whether it should go to town manager or town council, were there any instances like that? Every time the terms occurred, we had doubt that we were making the right choices. And it was the recommendation, the document that you have is what we think it is. But of course, the, uh, oh, the mic is on. Uh, it is what the committee thought was the right choice. And it was, it was only after discussion with as many people as we thought had uh, input on, on that recommendation. Uh, I think it's something that the council would be well advised to take a look at to make sure that our uh, recommendation is consistent with yours. Uh, I don't think there were many instances in which we had any serious doubt. Mm -hmm. Chris? Um, the way it was explained to me is that um, the choices were generally made on the basis of whether something was a legislative um, action or an executive action. So if it was um, right. an executive action, it would go to the town manager, and if it was a legislative action, it would go to the town council. Okay. Yeah, the one occasion where we, we did find that we made a mistake, we, we forgot that the council has the exclusive jurisdiction over the streets, and we had opted for something that was basically executive in nature uh, and assigned it to the town, town manager. But uh, you know, we caught ourselves and made the change to, to, to the council. Thank you. Dorsey. Um, uh, I'm glad Shalini asked that question uh, because I was hesitating to ask something similar. Um, I just, I guess when I first saw the, um, the section about the design review board, I felt like, you know, the planning board and the zoning board of appeals are, were both um, given to the council as uh, appointment authority under the charter. And it feels like the design review board is like a sister committee to those two committees. So um, it didn't seem immediately logical to me to have that be a town manager appointment. It seemed more logical to make it a town council for what that's worth. The, the reality is the charter is the charter, and that's the rule that governs us if at some point we want to go to for amendments to the charter 
I happen to know that one of our councilor members is keeping very detailed notes about issues. Um, we have that right. In fact, there's a requirement in the charter that there actually be a review of the charter after, what is it, two, five years, three years, five years, Mandy Jo? Five years. every 10 years with the years ending in, um, is it, they're saying six, so. Okay, thank you. But I think they were saying that there was some wiggle room there to choose one or the other. Were you not? Were you suggesting that the design review board could in fact, by virtue of the zoning bylaws, be appointed by the council? it was not inconsistent with the charter, it would be a legislative determination of the council. I see. Okay. So the issue then comes back to the council as to whether or not we feel that that is a legislative issue. And there you have the question of timing, whether or not we should just get the new base document on the books and then make changes thereafter, after, mm -hmm. you know, deeper thought on all of these issues. Right. Uh, we slavishly kept our attentions to the minimum making just those changes that absolutely needed to be made, uh, leaving everything else as grist for the mill going forward. Okay. Yes, Mandy Jo. Um, it would be inconsistent with the charter. Charter section 3.3C says, except as otherwise provided by this charter, the town manager shall appoint all members of multiple member bodies. So unless it was carved out in the charter, the town manager has, has the, is the appointing authority per the charter. Okay. Design review would be considered a multiple member body. Okay. Alyssa? And that is just something you can't change via bylaw unless the charter allows for it, which, as Bob pointed out, which it doesn't. So that's why we can't do it that way. Um, I, I appreciate the work everyone's put into this, and I want to point out that I still think that the number of steps that are involved in this are rather confusing. There are at least three and perhaps four 14 day periods associated with this entire process, some of which are legal notice in the newspaper, some of which are posting on the town bulletin board, which we are making an assumption that I don't know is based on any discussion with the town council, that putting it in the town council packet is good enough versus what we'd normally think of as meeting postings versus hearing postings. There are many, many steps to this, and I know that when I offered to make that, that I was told that was being worked on. So I would really hope that that's provided to the town council in advance of our July 1st meeting so we all know where we are in this process, and then maybe we can cut off one or two of the steps by combining the planning board and a CRC or town council hearing in the future to simplify at least one of those steps. Margaret? I completely agree that there needs to be a process laid out for the future, and it could be a well-coordinated process between the planning board and the council. Um, I just want to reiterate where the full proposed bylaws are posted. Again, uh, the public could click on uh, government on the town's homepage, it's amherstma.gov, click on government, click on council, and look at tonight's agenda packet. There is a clean copy of the proposed bylaw and a markup copy there or you could stop in at the town clerk's office and we have copies there as well. Okay, but um, as you know from conversations we had over the last two weeks, I finally threw up my hands and said, somebody provide me with a timeline um, of the exact steps. So we will get that, thank you. Anybody, any other comments from the council? Yes, Chris. I am a little unclear. I need some guidance about exactly what you need um, clarity on with regard to the timeline. Beginning to end, what steps need to be taken in what time frame and in what steps are allowed to be overlapped? And I'll be more than glad to look at that and tell you if it makes sense to me. Thanks, I appreciate that, I really do. Are there any questions from the council? I'm going to ask, are there any audience comments at this time? Okay, then hearing no more questions from the council, this is our first reading and we will move on to our next agenda item, okay? Thank you so much. We're moving on to the FY20 Capital Improvement Program. And 
Uh, Andy, I'm going to call on you. And Sonia, do you just want to come on up and take a seat with us? So you want me to start? Sure, please. Okay. Uh, so the two documents that I'm going to refer to you specifically were uh, documents that were included in the June 3rd packet for this uh, council and were repeated in the packet for tonight's meeting. One is the Finance Committee report and the other is the report of the Joint Capital Planning Committee, uh, which was the basis of the town manager's recommendations. He accepted the recommendations that we will be considering uh, for uh, the, the capital plan. Specifically on the um, item that is the report from uh, the Finance Committee, on this one I would refer you to a couple of pieces to it. One is that um, on pages six and seven, there's a brief description of the capital plan which refers back to the JCPC report. And um, then later in the same document, on pages 12 and 13, is the uh, proposed uh, transfer, um, author uh, authorization transfer order 20-05, which is what we're actually going to be voting on this evening, that adopts the uh, capital plan recommendations. Uh, the, the last thing that I'm going to um, just mention at this point is that, and I think I said this when we met on June 3rd also, that the Joint Capital Planning Committee report um, consisted of three parts, a narrative, then um, a complete description of the um, capital acquisition items that are proposed for this year's budget that's coming up, not the year we're in, but the year we're adopting for, uh, which is the year that begins on July 1. Uh, there's also in the back of the report uh, what's a continuous working document of the Joint Capital Planning Committee, and that is a 10-year plan that envisions all of the uh, needs that have been identified and uh, places them into a 10-year plan so that we can continue to um, focus on each of those items. Uh, and uh, that is not actually part of what is being adopted when you adopt the Appropriation and Transfer Order 2005. It, it only pertains to the actual appropriations for FY20. And uh, therefore, the 10-year plan is uh, there for information purposes, but is not a part of tonight's action. Uh, I think that that pretty well summarizes that there is one uh, transfer order pertaining to this year's uh, recommendations that is not for action tonight, um, and that is a bonding authority that we would need in the future for working towards completion of the major building projects, and uh, the town manager and finance director will make a recommendation when uh, we need to proceed with those, with consideration of that particular order uh, but it was not anticipated that it be this evening. So with that, I will uh, see if there's anything that either uh, Mr. Bachman or Ms. Aldrich have to add to what I just reported. I'm really here just to answer any questions. This has been presented a couple of times. Mr. Bachman? I just want to remind the council this capital plan was the subject of our June 10th public forum. It was reviewed at that time and we received public comment and actually dialogue. Uh, and at that point we clarified the point that Mr. Councilman Steinberg just made, which is there are three 
pieces in the capital plan that are basically set aside should we be able to proceed with a schematic design for DPW, a schematic design for a fire station, and the feasibility planning for the, a new public school, elementary school. Are there any questions on this part of the budget, the capital plan? Is there any public comment on this part of the capital, on this part of the budget, the capital plan? Then I'm going to read the motion and ask somebody to make that. Um, to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY20-05, an order appropriating funds for the proportion of the town of Amherst capital program equipment buildings facilities as recommended by the finance committee and shown on page 12 and 13 of the documents entitled town council finance committee recommendation on fiscal year 2020 budget. Do I hear a motion? So moved. A second. Dorothy? I second it. Any further questions? Okay. This may seem very fast to those of you out there, but there have been people studying this budget since May 1st in two meetings a week and many, many more. Are there other questions? If not, call the question. All those in favor, raise your hand and say Roll aye. Call. Roll call. Roll call. Oh, excuse me. Councillor Balmill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. The vote is 12 0 0 with one absent. Thank you. Um, the next item on our agenda is the CPAC proposals. However, I want to be very clear that does not include the proposal for 132 Northampton Road. Okay. However, there are three different pieces of the CPAC proposals, and we will be taking them up as we go along. Um, I understand that Mr. Odom is here to talk about and ask, answer any questions about CPAC, would you come forward, please? And Anthony, you may also want to come forward. Don't go too far, Sonia. <laughs> and I understand that Mr. Buddington is doing a college tour with his daughter. So thank you for being here tonight. Uh, would, do you want to just briefly describe the meeting of the CPAC? And I do mean briefly because we have talked about this and looked at it before. Because I didn't come prepared. Okay. Oh, oh sorry. I didn't come prepared to make a, a, a statement. You have the written report mm -hmm. in front of you. Most of the Recommendations were unanimous. A few were close to unanimous. Uh, with, uh, uh, and I'd have to look at the report myself. So I, I think I will wait and okay. answer specific questions, which I am prepared okay. to do. And CRC, uh, Steve, you reviewed this. Do you have a recommendation from CRC? Steve, we, we recommended the. Um, CPA proposals, four zero with one ever absent. Okay, thank you. And finance, Andy? Finance committee um, has reviewed all of the proposals with the exception of the one that has been postponed until, and we were waiting until after the public meeting um, for discussion of that item so that it, um, public meeting I think is now on the 24th and uh, the Finance Committee will be meeting on the 25th uh, and the timing was placed so that it would be, be between the public meeting and the uh, July 1 meeting of the Council. Uh, 
the committee considered all of the remaining proposals and were looking at um, questions of whether they were um, sound project proposals, financially responsible, consistent with purposes of the Community Preservation Act, or raised any other um, raised no other questions that we identified that were uh, of a significant nature. Uh, based upon that review, uh, we recommend all of the proposals that are before you tonight, which is uh, the entire grouping with the one that has been held aside. Mm -hmm. And we do note that uh, there are a series of votes required because while uh, the first motion, that, uh, the first order, which is order 2007, which is found on pages 15 and 16 of the Finance Committee report uh, appropriates money uh, for all the proposals. There's uh, a second piece that re uh, relates to acquisition of land, which mm -hmm. requires separate votes and requires two-thirds to pass as opposed to a simple majority. So thank okay. you. Are there any questions from the council? Mandy Joe? Yes. Can I have some statements instead of questions? Please. Okay. Um, I, I want to thank the CPA for its work this year. I served on JCPC and obviously I'm on the council. And so I have a couple of sort of requests maybe um, that, that you look at your timeline for producing a proposal. I know this was the first year we were all doing everything, but I know the finance committee with everything coming at it, JCPC, we were really pushed to, and I know JCPC is going to be looking at its timeline. If we could get all the timelines working in concert, that would be fantastic um, so that it all works well, including maybe some better communication between JCPC and CPA. So that's just a request I have. And I know Andy wants to speak to that. but. Um, and, and then I think I mentioned this when we had our joint meeting with the Finance Committee, when you guys were in front of the Finance Committee, about a some sort of looking at the housing funding policy. I was asking about the um, East Street School sort of general funding. The I think it's the 200000 that's recommended um, in this proposal and how that sort of general, not necessarily specific versus specific projects. So I just, I want to again reiterate a request to figure out does CPA want to be dealing with specific housing projects or do they want to sort of just push a certain amount of money to the Amherst Affordable Housing Trust for them to be dealing with it? So it's just another request, but I do appreciate all the work you guys have been doing. I think it's a great list of proposals this year. Yes. So uh, speaking to, the, to, to each of those, to the first point, uh, I'll, I'll say for myself, I think for other CPA members, we, we absolutely would have uh, appreciated a different timeline. This year we had a very unusual timeline due to the change in government and, and were not uh, able to convene until many months after the normal time. So, so I presume that won't be the case in future years, but uh, we had a much more shortened time period to, to do the work. Uh, and the, the second point, I'll just repeat for those who weren't in that finance committee meeting, uh, that is an ongoing discussion within the CPA committee exactly to your question of to what extent we should be looking at individual projects versus funding the housing trust and letting them look at individual projects. and and. Um, and so it's an ongoing discussion both within CPA and with the other committees. And I think among the issues that have to be looked at in that discussion are the breadth, the, the housing trust can, can set aside money, but there and, and how their agenda and set of potential projects overlaps or doesn't overlap with the Full, to what extent it overlaps with the full range of housing needs and opportunities within Amherst. And I think that that's a big piece, at least from my perspective, of the question. Uh, and, I, and certainly the sense was uh, this year that the appropriation, the, the recommendation for, for funding the trust at the level we did was, was appropriate. Uh, 
specifically because of East Street, but and more generally because even if that project didn't pan out, the the work that they're trying, the the pro what they're trying to develop, uh, fits what we understand to be the needs of the community. So it's not yes. So I just want to say so as not to prolong a conversation which obviously is ongoing, and some people have been charged with kind of looking at that calendar. I just want to mention to the general public that this is something we are looking at, uh, particularly because uh, we did have our December 2nd swearing in and December 3rd er, late start, if you will. Uh, we will not hopefully ever see that kind of delay again. And we do want to thank uh, the CPIC for jumping in and getting their work done. I know you met virtually every week during at least two or three months. So it was quite something. Dorothy. Um, I'm wondering, um, in the news is the fact that there may be um, a bonus for Community Preservation Act if the taxes come in higher than originally planned um, in, to Boston. If there is a disbursement of money to, to broadly and Amherst receives a small piece, what would the CPAC do with that? I, I want to actually ask the town manager to address that because uh, in reality, the state gave us a mandate and then stopped funding it. So there is legislation and we've been advocating for additional funds coming into CPAC from uh, the state to uh, better match what they promised when they started the Community Preservation Act. Um, that would be for future years. It wouldn't be retroactive. So we would just have more money in the future if they did pass that. And would it actually be more money or would it be funded so that there is more state money and therefore less tax money? It would be more, it would be more money because the state would be putting in more money to match what we already collect. Thank you. Okay. Are there other questions or comments by the council before we move to, yes, Andy. Yeah, just um, on schedule, it was a difficult issue and I um, have to take some responsibility because I had the select board side of me before I had the council side of me. And as a select board member, um, I ended up asking Mr. Buddington to hold the process until the council was seated uh, because it seemed like an awkward point to do it in the transition. We also recognized that it was a one-year problem, and we thoroughly recognized that um, unlike town meeting, which would have had to have had recommendations by um, early April in order to get them before town meeting and in the town meeting uh, mailings, that that was not a requirement. So we actually had a little bit more flexibility, but. Finance Committee is going to be looking at this as indicated to make sure that we come up with a schedule that makes sense for all involved. And I do want to thank the uh, Community Preservation Act Committee for their hard work on putting this together and the, uh, giving uh, consideration to the proposals as it did and it did it does every year. Uh, so I think that's okay. Any other comments from the council before I move to public comment? Is there any public comment at this time? All right, then we're gonna begin with the three motions. I'll read each and ask for someone to make that motion. The first motion is to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY20-07 in order appropriating the FY2020 Community Preservation Act budget as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on pages 15 and 16 of the document entitled Town Council Finance Committee Recommendation on Fiscal Year 2020 Budget. Do I hear a motion? Man, oh, Pat, so moved? Yes. Second. I'll second. Thank you. Any further conversation about this? Then please raise your hand. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Oops, oops, roll call. A roll call is not required for CPA. However, if the council would like to take a roll call, I'm happy to call it. Let's go with a roll call. Councillor Brewer. Aye. Councillor DeAngelis. Yes. Councillor Dumont. Yes. Councillor Griesmer. Yes. Councillor Haneke. Yes. Councillor Pam. Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. 
Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Balmill? Yes. The vote is 12 0 0 with one absent. Okay. We're moving on to the next one, and perhaps because we've just voted the full package, but now we have to vote some specific. However, these are two third votes, and they do require roll call. Is that correct? Excuse me, they don't require roll call, they require nine votes. Nine votes, Nine Thank votes you. in favor. Okay. Uh, the first motion is to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY20-08, an order authorizing the time, the acquisition of Zala property for open space purposes as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on page 17 of the document entitled Town Council Finance Committee Recommendation on Fiscal Year 220 Budget. Do I hear a motion? So moved. And second? Dorothy? I second it. Okay. And then we'll just go with a show of hands. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Abstain? And one absent. Okay. The next one is to adopt appropriation. I'm sorry. I, I just want to announce the vote. That was 12 0 0 with one absent. Thank you very much. Um, the next one is to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY 20 09, an order authorizing the acquisition of the Keat. Haskins property, as recommended by the Finance Committee, and shown on pages 18 and 19 of the document entitled the Town Council Finance Committee Recommendation on Fiscal Year 2020 Budget. Do I hear a motion? Do I, I so move. Dorothy, a second? Second. George? Any further comment? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain? The vote is 12 0 0 with one absent. Thank you. Um, we're going to, before we take a break, aren't you pleased to hear me say that? Yes. <laughs> we're going to actually go to item E, which is the budget amendments. And Sonia, do you want to just explain our housekeeping issue here? This is an order for year end to um, appropriate money for deficits that we may have in functional areas. Town meeting voted our budget by functional area, so we can't overspend that bottom line. And um, we typically move excess money in other functional areas to cover the deficits that we're going to have. And this year we had two areas that were likely to go in deficit. And one of them is snow and ice, which did go into deficit about $115,000. We're asking to transfer 115 from the general government section. And normally it comes from general government. That's where we have our reserves for salaries. That's also where we have our most activity, most departments, and the most savings. And the other transfer is the sum of $73,875. Um, from the general government area again to public safety. And this is to cover um, fire department scuba compressor that bro broke down this year and it had to be replaced. That was about $29,000 and the rest is for um, salary increases that were voted contractual. They settled this year and that's pretty much it. Okay, are there questions at this time? Okay, the motion then, yes. Uh, the motion reads, to adopt appropriation and transfer order FY19-82 in order amending the FY2019 budget as recommended by the Finance Committee. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Second. Pat, any further discussion? This requires a roll call vote. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? 
Yes. Councillor Ross. Yes. Councillor Ryan. Yes. Councillor Shane. Yes. Councillor Schreiber. Yes. Councillor Steinberg. Yes. Councillor Balmill. Yes. Councillor Brewer. Yes. The vote is 12 0 0 with one absent. Thank you. Thank We're you. going to take a five minute break. I'd like people to be back here no later than 8.52. 7.52. We're moving right along. 7.52. Thank you. I'd like to reconvene. Let me note we're on time. Okay, the next item on our agenda is, is the limitations on campaign contributions bylaw. This is the second reading. I'm going to call first on Mandy Jo, and I want to point out that we have slides, and we're going to go through a process of uh, placing the motion and then seconding, and then I believe there are actually some amendments. So, Mandy Jo. So yeah, I'm going to start with the motion. I move to adopt the limitations on campaign contributions bylaw in accordance with Amherst Home Rule Charter Section 2.10a as presented by the GOL committee and amended as follows. Amend Section C to be amended to strike the words local charity in the second to last sentence and replace with the words, quote, public charity subject to MGL Chapter 12, Section 8, end quote. And if we can, so this first slide here, Actually, before I say that, can I get a second? Can we go to the yeah. second? Okay, so the first slide is the first half of this bylaw. No changes under the motion I just made. If we go to the second slide, that's okay. This one shows what I just read as the amendment, and I'm going to explain why I'm including that amendment in the, in the motion I just made. Local charity is kind of vague, um, so Instead, I'm proposing an amendment to public charity subject to MGL Chapter 12, Section 8, which is the same in a sense or a very similar way that um, it is described if a candidate were to dissolve their candidates committee and still have money left. One of the places they could put that money is a public charity subject to MGL Chapter 12, Section 8. So I've attempted to sort of clarify local charity to conform with the, the sort of laws around dissolution of candidates committees to make it similar. And the other piece that you amended with that motion? Uh, I, well, the of the not exceeding, that was as per what GOL reported out. So that one okay. was in, included in that. Okay, so that motion has been made and seconded. Evan. Yes, uh, I'd like to move to amend sections 8.1, 8.2, and B of the bylaw to strike the decimal 0.25 in each of those sections. We go to the next slide, please. And replace it with the decimal 0.5. So in those three sections, replacing the decimal 0.25 with 0.5. And I'm happy to speak to that if permissible. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Please speak to the motion. So. Uh, Councilor Haneke and I obviously brought forth uh, what we thought was the uh, best version of this bylaw that we promulgated. Um, but one of the things that I uh, am firmly committed to as a counselor on this uh, council is being open to feedback from my fellow counselors and recognizing that uh, I bring forth a measure and then I listen to all of you so that the final measure, should it pass, is representative of the council. Uh, we've obviously heard uh, a lot of talk, a, a lot of input on this bylaw, um, but one of the common pieces of feedback that we heard uh, was a general sense that 0.25 limiting campaign contributions from an individual to $250 was simply too low. We also heard that um, from one of our public commenters, uh, and so although um, my personal belief is that 250 uh, was was acceptable. Uh, I want to be responsive to the feedback I heard from my colleagues on the council uh, who felt that it was too low. Uh, where this bylaw comes from is the fact that, uh, as far as I'm concerned, uh, 
the ability to receive a $1,000 donation from a single individual uh, is out of scale with the realities of elections in Amherst. I think that uh, a $1,000 ceiling is too high. Uh, so the question, if you agree with that statement, is a $1,000 too high? The question is, well, what is the right number? Uh, we obviously put forth 250, and, and we heard from many of our colleagues that that was too low. Uh, we believe that 500 um, seem to be the common refrain. This mirrors what you see in Northampton. Um, it also, we heard a common critique that perhaps uh, 250 might uh, impede a candidate um, who perhaps is not your typical candidate but has access to a, a person who has some sum of money. Um, and there were three particular candidates for school committee, um, all of whom are considered to be demographically uh, people who we would want to encourage to run for office, uh, all of whom began their campaigns with a $500 donation. And there was a worry that reducing to $250 uh, would, would harm that. Uh, so this now ups that to $500, so uh, it, it reduces from 1000 that ceiling, which I believe and, I believe can, and many people believe is too high, um, but it would not have prevented those three candidates from getting their start. Um, and so to me, this is a compromise um, in response to what we heard uh, and the hope that, uh, we can all, that, that we can agree that $1,000 from a single individual is a very large donation for this community. Um, and so having that into 500 would be more appropriate. I don't know if Councilor Hanny can to add. So the motion has been made and seconded, and now there is an amendment on the floor that has been made and seconded. Would other counselors like to speak to the amendment? Kathy. Okay, when, when we first considered this two weeks ago, my feeling was the issue was not so much the 250 where I was fine with setting it at 250 in the pack, but that I didn't think this was enough um, to address a barrier to entry and a barrier to campaigning. I thought there were a lot of other pieces that would go into it. And there's a, I have a feeling that if we pass something like this, we think we've done something major when it's a small step. And I'd rather see a work group formed, a study group, whatever we call it, that's reporting back in six months with a series of steps. And this might be a piece of it, but it would be a package. And it's website support, uh, voting list support, uh, phone calls. You know, it, it's things that would just make the mechanics of running cheaper so you wouldn't need as much money in the first place. And I, I just want people to know I limited my own contributions to 100 and was advised that that was crazy. But it, it worked, you know, and, and I got a lot of s small pieces. And the other thing that I noticed is that if you think you're setting a limit on something, if uh, a person is a couple, they can each give you half and get right back to the bigger number, you know, if they were willing in the first place. So there are ways around these numbers um, if, if we're worried about undue influence of money. Um, so that's my feeling that th this in itself, the original 250, I didn't think was a bad idea. I just didn't think it was enough. And it makes it feel like we've gone to a great deal of effort to put a bylaw on the book that doesn't begin to address the larger problem. Shalini. So I took uh, the recommendation that one of the residents had last time, Jennifer Sher, if I might cite her, that we should go and talk to some of the residents from the different communities. And I did reach out to several people. I heard back from four of them. Uh, and they gave their, they were willing to share the names. So it was including Do Dr. Sanji Johnson Anderson, Gazakhaya, D. Shabazz, who was there, and Marita Banda. And all four of them felt very emphatically that there should be a finance uh, limit. Uh, from their perspective, and this is a very diverse community of people, and, and these are residents who are very active and would maybe potentially be people who would want to run in the future. And they felt, in fact, I'm happy to read one of the, do I have the time to read something that one of them said, which I think. Um, you may. It's,
This is from Dr. Sanji, and she said, I believe it helps to even the playing field just a bit. Let politicians work to increase participation and engagement of the community by not relying on huge donations from the moneyed few, but by appealing to as much of the electorate as possible and build the coffers of the campaigns with limit-imposed donations. So in to listening to these people, then I went online and did some research, and I looked at some of the policies out there on finance, uh, campaign finance, and I found several agencies, and I'm just citing one of them called Demos, which is a policy making organization, and they all sort of directed towards making people think, or the local policies think about questions like, are candidates raising money from large pools of small donors from their communities, as opposed to raising most of their campaign funds through large contributions from a handful of wealthy donors, or people with uh, special interests. So which brings me to the third point then, which I think Andy had hinted on last time or mentioned last time, that when we do get funding from, let's say, a few donors, which are large, let's say it's developers, or let's say it's a group of people who are very, um, uh, uh, they hold art as very important, or climate change is very important. So any special issues group that is funding, does that put some sort of a pressure on, on the candidates to promote that agenda over looking at holistically what the town needs? So that's the third point. And then the fourth is, um, I agree with what Kathy said, that just doing this, obviously all of us are agreeing is not enough. However, this in combination with services that the town could provide, like websites for every candidate. We already have free parking, that's supporting us. Or maybe if we could take it further and provide childcare. So having these fine, so doing these multiple things would definitely send a message to the people of diverse committee, communities that, hey, you too can do this. Okay, Steve. Yeah, so I remain against this even as amended because I don't think it's the place of this particular body. If this were a citizen petition, I'd feel differently about this. But we're a group of 13 people that won our elections under the state guidelines. So we all have the ability to raise $1,000. Some of us may or may not have chosen to do that. And I don't think it's up to us to tell future groups what they shall or shan't do. There's a state law. I don't think Amherst is exceptional. I mean, in other words, this state law applies to all 351, yes, communities in Massachusetts. So I don't see anything exceptional about Amherst different from any other community that $1,000 is distasteful or tasteful, and we all know that anyone can, as has been said, anyone can run a campaign that they'll only accept $5, and anyone knows that if you accept a whole bunch of donations that are $1,000, you will be subject, that will become a political <laughs> albatross, that you, you might get more yard signs, but you'll also, that will also become an issue with whomever, whoever else is running. The other thing that I feel very uncomfortable is that we're all incumbents, right? So I was doing the calculation. I have $1,000 worth of yard signs in my basement. So if I decide to run again, I have a $1,000 head start. I have $1,000 worth of graphic design on my computer. So already I have a $2,000 head start. So I'm definitely not in a position where I can say all future candidates for <laughs> You know, you, you, even if you have someone that's willing to help even the playing field, you know, give a $1,000 donation just for yard signs, that they can't do that. Okay. Other comments? Darcy? Uh, I, I'd agree that, um, you know, the, the idea and the intention behind this is very admirable, uh, but that it's just... Um, the problem is much bigger than, than just uh, cash. Uh, we talked about this the last time, that it goes to in-kind donations. And um, I feel like we need to, if we are going to do something, I think it wouldn't be a bad idea to, to um, work on this issue. And I would um, agree with Kathy's idea that we, if we did it, we should really do a much deeper dive uh, to look at 
all of the aspects of leveling the playing field because um, uh, you know, I was thinking about it today, all the different uh, valuable um, things that we need in order to run a campaign, um, the vast majority of them are not cash. Uh, they are um, uh, uh, mailing lists and um, help with the uh, website design and so on. And you know, I agree with Steve that there's a you know incumbents will have a big advantage. I'd, uh, I'd like to ask people to stick to the amendment at this time. We'll go back for the full thing later. The amendment right now is to move this from two hundred and fifty dollars to five hundred dollars. Okay. Well, okay. I I am not in favor of the amendment, mostly because I'm not in favor of the underlying motion. Okay. Pat. What I was going to speak to wasn't the amendments uh, okay. completely. Let me see if I can, what part of it I can pull out. Um, I feel like the intent is to level the playing field, but it doesn't do that. Um, depending on your personal finances, um, those aren't um, limited. Um, and that already un uh, unlevels the playing field. Um, and I feel like, well, the rest are questions I have and a question, uh, uh, something about the fine, so I should probably wait. Mm -hmm. Dorothy. Um, I agree with Steve that there is no reason to change the state law, and um, I also agree that money isn't the issue in winning. When I first started running for office many, many years ago, I was part of a group, people were experienced, and I learned how you campaign. So when I started to run this time, I had nothing, all right, but I knew how to campaign. That's not something that you buy with money. So what I think we need to do is to workshops and to say, to do what the women did back in the 1970s. Workshops were teaching women, how do you run for office? And they still run those in many places. It was assumed that, that if you want a group of people to run, you go out, you do outreach, and you show them how you do it. But, yes, uh, I'm sorry, Andy. I guess uh, part of this is a question. I don't know if um, Councillor Haneke has an answer, but if something is enacted tonight, uh, both on the amendment and the final, will it affect the elections that are coming in the next round? Uh, because uh, I think we ought to know what we're affecting. Yeah, yes, Mandy Jo. So if there is a positive vote tonight that receives at least, I believe it's seven, because it's just a general bylaw, so it just needs a majority of the full council um, on the main motion, then it would take effect 14 days from tonight, barring any actual resident um, gathering of signatures of a significant number of signatures to try and veto that action. If that doesn't happen, it would take effect in 14 days and would be on the books for the upcoming local municipal election. Okay, are there further, yes, Pat. I have two questions and you can make me stop. Are they into this issue of uh, one 500? Is, uh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. One is, what is, are there in the Massachusetts general laws, uh, election laws, any limits on PAC contributions? I'd like to know that, and I'd also like to know what was actually spent in Amherst by any candidate, whether they won or lost. And I don't know whether that's, yeah. It's, pu it's yeah. public information. You can go to people's finance reports and it's public information. That information is actually posted somewhere on the town clerk's webpage area. What we understand, and I also support a study group. Okay. Are there other questions, comments at this time? Yes, please. Was your question, before I answer it, contributions to PACs or contributions from PACs to? Okay. So there are limits on both. Um, um, the state limit, which A2 and A and B actually address on this one, um, a, an individual right now in the state can contribute $500 per calendar year to a political action committee. 
A lobbyist can contribute 200. There is no limit for a statewide candidate's committee to contribute to a PAC. There is no limit for a county, legislative, municipal, or other candidate or candidate's committee to contribute to a PAC. A PAC can contribute $500 to another PAC. A people's committee can contribute $500 to a PAC. A state party committee can contribute $500 to a PAC. And a local party committee can contribute $500 to a PAC. A ballot question committee is not allowed to contribute to a PAC. Um, a, a B, under the main motion, would change the $500 limit for an individual contribution to a PAC to 125. Under the amendment motion, the motion to amend that we're currently discussing, it would turn it to 250. Um, a PAC can currently, under state law, contribute $500 a year to a candidate or candidate's committee. Um, and if you want me to go through where else it can contribute money, I, I can. The A A2 currently would, under the main motion, the original motion that I made, would limit that to 125 per calendar year. Under the amendment we're discussing, if it was raised to 0.5, it would limit it to 250 per year. Is there other comments at this time? Andy. Yeah, now that I had the question and the answer to the first one, I think that I want to um, actually go and last time I had some reservations about whether this would really have an effect on bringing more candidates in and how it would um, have that effect. Um, with the amendment, which I am going to support because I think that it sort of moves us is in, to an in-between position, uh, I want to vote for the, the amendment tonight and I will vote for the entire proposal tonight, which I'm gonna, I can mention later for my reasons why when we get there, I think uh, the President has requested we hold that piece. Okay. Darcy? I just have one more comment that I, I feel like if uh, one of the things that we, if we did decide to study this further or dig deeper, look at more of the aspects of leveling the playing field, um, uh, we could look at things like what types of in-kind help were actually um, claimed and um, what's the difference between um, for example, um, having to claim $125 for a mailing because it's being put out by a political action committee and you only have to claim one-tenth of the amount that it cost versus if you're not being supported by the political action committee, you have to claim $1,000 for the mailing. Um, so, but you, bo you both people get the same benefit, even though one only has to claim 125, the other has to claim 1,000. So uh, that's the type of thing I think that we should look at more carefully about, you know, what is going on in our local elections and, and how to make, how to level the playing field. Okay. Are there any other comments on the issue of 500? Yes, Alyssa. Yes, I'm confused by all the materials we've been provided. I, the slide when we page down, as we can on our packet here, shows information that's been X'd out. We have two versions of very similar materials. This is not the slide we're on at this yeah. time. Both of which include both two reports we have in today's packet that include the Mass General Law chart that answers those questions. We've been provided that before. It's been provided again tonight. It's been provided in two different versions, and I'm still seeing them marked up as though the answer was 250 instead of 500. So I'm just really confused One of the by reason, the different sections that we're looking at because we've got two reports that still say 250. And then okay. this part. Can I just say that one of the reasons that I asked that we do these slides is because to try to level the confusion, okay? <laughs> um, so the very first two slides were the original motion, which was made and seconded. This slide, which only affects this page, is the motion to change from 250 to 500. That is the motion that we are speaking to at this time. Is there any further comment before I go to the audience for this? Yes, Evan. 
So I think the intention, of course, was to keep the conversation limited to the amendment that didn't happen. That's correct. Um, but I think the, the question for the amendment, right, is um, if this final version were to pass, right, would you prefer the limit at 0.25 or 0.5, right? And so uh, I heard a lot of, I'm going to vote against the amendment because I don't agree with the entire thing. And I don't, I think the question is, if the, if, even if you disagree with the whole thing, if this does pass, which of those two numbers would you prefer? And that, that was sort of what I'm getting at with the amendment is, we've heard some concerns, is 250 too low? Is 1,000 too high? Right, I think that's sort of the question. And, and that was the spirit of, in which the amendment was offered to us. It, even if you disagree with this whole thing on its surface, if it were to pass, would you feel more comfortable with it at 500? Thank you. Dorothy. The issue is not 250 or 500. The issue is that there's no limitation on individual money, so candidates who have money and feel like spending it can spend whatever they want. Um, and the other issue is a political action committee. Um, com if you are a novice and you swear on to that political action committee, you can get, you don't really need money because they can provide the experience and the background, the information, the mailing list, all of those things. But if you want to be an independent candidate, then these limits just are irrelevant to the task at hand. So I, I just don't see that this has much to do with widening and opening the playing field. Other additional comments? George. When I look at these numbers, um, 500, 250, I personally would not accept more than $100 under any circumstance, but that's a personal decision. And um, I would be happy to explain that to a voter who asked the question. Um, so I guess the numbers here really don't mean much to me, um, 250 versus 500, because both of them are too large. But that's just me speaking as an individual candidate, making my personal choice. Um, but I am uncomfortable with making that choice for others. I also think this leaves out the role of the voter. Um, the voter, I assume, pays attention. And these, as was raised by by Steve and others, um, these are political questions and legitimately can be asked by the voter. I see you got X amount of money from so-and-so, could you explain that? Um, but we seem to want to be able to sort of solve this ourselves by setting limits. So I just, I'm very uncomfortable with the whole idea of limits beyond the state has set limits, fine. Um, but beyond that, I think it's really a role for the, the, the informed electorate um, to, to ask questions if they're uncomfortable with what people are, uh, the money they're getting. If you want me to set a limit, I'd say $100. But um, I don't think that number is going to fly. Um, and even then, I would still be uncomfortable because that's just my personal position. And um, I would explain that if someone asked. And if someone accepted 500, they could explain it. But we apparently want to decide that ahead of time that this is going to be the limit. Shalini. I think it's more than what we individually decide. I think what we decide signals something to the people. And when we say you, there, you can get up to $1,000, it automatically intimidates many people. That's what I'm hearing when I go and talk to people. So I spoke to at least five different people from different communities. And they were immediately like, there's no way I can. And that's there's a shock value. It, it communicates our values as a town that what, you know, what do we stand for? And so the number we all decide beyond individual freedom to choose what our values are, it is collectively we are creating values in what we stand for as a town. It's a signaling uh, method. I don't know how, I mean, that's something to really think about the number signal something. I am not saying don't talk about the PACs and, and don't look at the other services that we're going to provide. This is not in lieu of that. This is in addition to that. What is a signal? And I just want to clarify, I was endorsed by a PAC and I'm an independent candidate. Are there other comments? Steve? Yeah, so we're trying to guess how people will spend $1,000 and where that $1,000 comes from. If you've been in Amherst for a while, you know there's been all kinds of common wisdoms. Like it used to be, a, it used to be seen as um, not right to campaign for town meeting. So it just, and so some of these 
common wisdoms or some of these sort of limitations, really what they do is they favor the known or they favor the, it does exactly the opposite of what I think the intent of this is. So I think there was exactly one $1,000 donation in the town council election. And that happens to be somebody that was running in council, uh, district four. And he did it because he, or he or she did it because um, that was the way that he felt was the most, it was from a family member and it was the most effective way for him to do a direct mailing. Didn't have the time, didn't have the ability to go door to door. So that was a strategy on his part. I have no judgment as to whether or not that was an effective strategy, but that was his decision. $1,000 is not a ton of money, and it sounds like a ton of money we want in Amherst. We, we, it's almost like we've taken a vow of poverty. In, real, you know, in, in the world, it really is not you know, a ton of money. There are lots of people who are willing to, um, you know, to, but why are we judging that? Are there additional comments at this time? Is there a public, I'm sorry, Pat. Can I ask? Please come, yes. Is the public gonna be limited to talking about this amendment? Should, should we vote on the amendment before we take public I comment? I believe we need to have okay. public comment okay. before we vote on anything. Thank you. My name is John Bonifaz. I live here in Amherst. I'm the co-founder and president of Free Speech for People. Uh, we're an organization that's been dedicated for nearly a decade to taking on big money in politics and corruption in our government. I'm a constitutional attorney. I've specialized in campaign finance and voting rights law for more than 25 years. Uh, I'm here to urge uh, this council not to enact limits that are far beyond what ordinary people can afford. And in fact, they can't afford $1,000, they can't afford $500, far more closer to Councilor Ryan's suggestion of $100. Um, just to give you some context for this, uh, the United States Supreme Court uh, has, of course, had a, a ruling dating back to 1976 uh, which equated money with speech and allowed for unlimited campaign spending that included unlimited spending by candidates themselves who happen to have uh, those means. But at the same time, the court recognized the important governmental interest in preventing corruption and the appearance of corruption, which is why contribution limits were upheld. And to answer the Councilor Driver's concerns about this governmental body setting limits, legislative bodies all over this country at the state and local level set limits on campaign finance. There are uh, campaign finance regulatory regimes all over the country. So in fact, I, I wanna appreciate the spirit at which this proposal has come for, forward. And in fact, I do think given that we've never had a town council, that there should be some kind of campaign finance regulatory structure put in place and that that be different than the statewide limits. $1,000 applied to a statewide election is very different than applied to a town election. It also ought to be noted that that limit used to be $500 until very recently for statewide elections. We were involved in, in a case that just recently uh, the Supreme Court decided not to hear and in favor of Montana's campaign contribution limits. We were there helping to defend those limits. And we filed a brief before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, uh, which the proponents for trying to challenge the limits sought to get the Supreme Court to reverse. They, they failed in that. But in that brief, we cited a study focusing that while 13.4% of American households earn $100,000 or more, 86% of federal contributions over $200 come from that subset of our population. People of color, young people, and women are significantly underrepresented among the donor class. 90% of $200 plus federal contributions came from predominantly white neighborhoods. This is a DEMOS study, actually. 
And when we look at donors who gave over $200 in the 2000 presidential election, 95.8% were white, 70% were male, and 70% were age 50 or older. So the question here is what are the values that we want in our town with respect to our elections? One of those values ought to be to prevent corruption and the appearance of corruption. Another value ought to be to lift up the basic promise of political equality for all and leveling the political uh, uh, playing field. To answer Councilor Ross' question, I know it wasn't directed at members of the public, but if this proposal was solely the original one for $250 limits, I'd be coming up here to say I, I support that. I would also be coming up to say I support Councilor Schoen's idea of adding to that original proposal a provision that would implement a study group to go beyond this because contribution limits alone do not address this problem of leveling the playing field. Demos, which is a group that we work closely with at Free Speech for People, proposes public funding of elections as the way to bring people into the process. Uh, and Seattle most recently passed a system of democracy vouchers that enables those who don't have access to well-connected or wealthy interests, or even people who, frankly, uh, can give $250, who we might somehow think are not wealthy, but as I cited in these statistics, are uh, based on the donor class, that we ought to have a different system for getting people into the political process. To address uh, the concern... I need to ask you to wrap up, please. Sure. I'll just say, to address the concern about uh, you know, those who are independently wealthy, that's going to have to require reversing Buckley v. Vallejo, but at a minimum, uh, this council can address these questions in a more holistic way and certainly not set limits at $500, which is, in our view, absurd. And I will add that I uh, am also here to speak on behalf of Meg Gage, who submitted to you a letter. She's not in town, uh, but she submitted to you a letter along with a warrant article that she was preparing to gather signatures for, gathered over 200. We worked closely with her at Free Speech for People. That warrant article included the $250 limit, but it had other reforms as well. Thank you. Thank you. Are there other comments? Yes. Please come forward. Uh, I'm Catherine Oppie, a Redgate Lane, uh, but I am here on behalf tonight, uh, speaking on behalf of Amherst Forward, which is a local volunteer network working to engage residents on critical town issues including smart growth, development, high quality services and infrastructure and responsive government. And um, I want to thank Councillors Ross and Haneke for bringing this proposal forward um, and following um, Mr. Bonifaz, which I completely support what he had to say and as does Amherst Forward. We strongly support more rigorous and restrictive campaign finance limits like those in the current proposals in front of you. In the run-up to the election that seated you all here as our first town councilors, the role of money in the campaigns was a steady feature of townwide debates regarding the election and of the new charter itself. Now that you're seated, we believe town interests in this remains high enough to warrant uh, action. And we believe this proposal contains sensible refinements to existing state laws regarding campaign finance that are right size for Amherst. And as I listen to Mr. Bonifaz, we would, Amherst Forward would absolutely uh, support even lower um, uh, limits than are before you tonight. We do understand that this is a very complicated issue and that it is not merely about money, but this is a very important first step. And as Councillor Ball Min has pointed out for uh, community members uh, who are trying to begin to get access to uh, running their own campaigns, I think the message from the town council is saying anybody can do this if the limit is $100 or $200. Um, and it's a very, very important first step. We understand your concern for the nuances and potential unintended consequences of this first step. Some of you are concerned that new candidates could suffer without access to one or two large donations. That perhaps having a friend or family member donate $1,000 could jumpstart a political newcomer's campaign, saving them from the difficulty of finding four people to give them $250 or two people to give them $500. 
$500 or 20 people to give them $50. Based on what we witnessed among the campaigns that resulted in all of you being seated on this council, we think this concern is overblown. If anything, it may make it more, it may make more sense to place a cap on donations so that limits don't favor incumbents who have ready access to large donors. Limiting all donations, including to PACs, uh, to less than $1,000 and whatever number you might consider tonight, Amherst Forward, for example, voluntarily limits donations to $52 per individual annually and take nothing from businesses or anyone outside of Amherst. This seems to be a reasonable step, leveling the playing field for first-time candidates. Thank you very much. Are, th are there other comments? Okay, th we have an amendment on the floor, and it is to change the 0.25 to 0.5, therefore changing it, the limit from 250 to $500. Are there further comments? Then I'm going to call the question. Um, all those in favor of the amendment, which is to change the limit from 250 to $500. Please raise your hand by saying, and say aye. Okay, that's four. Opposed? Nay. Nay. Abstain. Okay, the motion fails. There's a second motion, I believe. Not right now. No? Okay. Can I just ask, is the very first version we saw, 250, that's off the table because we were only voting on the higher limit? So no, Evans, the 250 is still on the table. So, okay. so I think slide so one So we go on back thing, to the first two the slides, very please. first slide. Right. That's the current this motion is, on the table now. This is the current motion on the table. Is there any other comment on this? Yes, Evan. Yeah, so I've been holding my comment on the broader thing till after that uh, amendment was voted. I will say uh, I'm learning the legislative process is very difficult, as I hear from some people that 250 was too low, and then others that 500 was too high. Um, I don't know what. Anyways, um, here, here, here's, here's what I want to say, because there's been a lot of talk about leveling the playing field and who demographically we're working uh, to, to help. And I want to put on my hat as the only renter on the community, the youngest person on the council, and also someone who is brand new to government. When I considered running, the one thing that almost kept me out of this race is, can I raise enough money? Uh, that, that obstacle of fundraising was incredibly intimidating. And the reason for that is that my social sphere, from which I would, I would extract donations from, is um, people who are graduate students or postdocs, people who don't make a lot of money. Uh, my campaign started off uh, largely with 10, 20, and $30 donations, not because of some self-imposed limit, but because that was my network. And so there's this, com there's this thought of, well, what if someone uh, who wouldn't otherwise run has like a wealthy friend that could help them out? That's great for them, but what if they don't, right? And so I started cobbling together a campaign based on very small donations because that's what I had access to. And when we had the first uh, eighth day proceeding, uh, or whatever it was, campaign finance uh, form, and I looked at the people in my district and I saw a $1,000 donation from a single individual to someone who was running um, in my district, my immediate thought was, I can't compete with that because it would take so many more people for me to reach out to, to match that. And so when we talk about, you know, does this actually level the playing field, it's not just about how much money you have in the bank account, it's what are the self-imposed barriers that you face. And I remember looking at that $1,000 donation and thinking, uh-oh, if I have to compete with someone who has access to, even if they're family, and out in New York City giving them $1,000, 
maybe I'm not going to be able to do this. And that's something that's really tough if you don't have political experience, right? Now, it worked out in my favor in the end, but that doesn't mean that someone going into that wouldn't feel the same way. And I would absolutely disagree with Council Schreiber saying $1,000 is not a lot of money. Uh, that's more than half of what I raised total. Uh, I got received from a single person by someone running in my district. So, you know, I, I think that there are real barriers that are presented to this. What I keep hearing that's really frustrating to me is this idea of this won't solve the problem and so we shouldn't do it because we need a comprehensive solution. Uh, I'm someone who tends to favor incrementalism because I believe that you can make real progress with incremental steps and that oftentimes if you try to do something really big and comprehensive, you don't get anything at all. We've seen that with, you know, immigration reform. So, you know, the question becomes, is this a step in the right direction? Now, I'm hearing, you know, Councillor Pam and Councillor Dumont saying, well, this doesn't cover all these other things. And the reason is it can't, right? Does this address contributions from a wealthy individual to their self? No, because as was noted, it literally cannot. Does it address in-kind contributions that are not considered by OCPF to be in-kind contributions? No, because it cannot. So the question becomes, because it doesn't do everything, do we do nothing? And, and my worry is that if we make perfect the enemy of good, then we never do any good. And so if we agree that perhaps paired with other things, this could be effective, then pass this and let's start working on other things, right? I agree, this is not a silver bullet. This won't solve the problem. It's one piece. But if we wait until we have all of the pieces to make this happen, we might never get there. And so my hope is that if you think that this is something that, yeah, if it's paired with a couple other things could work, that you will pass this and then work with me to do those other things. But this idea of this won't solve the problem, so let's not do it, and let's throw it to a study committee, and maybe something good will come out of that, uh, to me is misguided. I'm going to take off my hat as president and speak as a counselor. I voted against the 500. I also set a limit of $100 on my own campaign. Um, yes, I come out of a political family, and we've done campaigns in this town before, but I limited it to District 2, which we had never done before either. So I personally don't want to see us raise it to 500. I personally like to see it contained to 250. And I do feel that it is the responsibility of this council to get the ball rolling. And so I am in favor of this. Other comments? Yes, Dorothy. When I started to run, I wasn't thinking about money. I was thinking, I don't know very many people. Why would anyone want to vote for me? The majority of my campaign was spent trying to meet people and trying to go door to door. Uh, the, my first flyers were done with my own camera and running them off of my computer. Uh, the issue is not really whether you accept uh, up to $250. The point is, how do you reach people? And I found, since I came, went into the campaign, and I wasn't thinking about money, but really, how do I get voters? I found that my choice not to be supported by a PAC put me very behind the eight ball, because they provided access to lots of people. What value you put on it or how you value it, I really don't know. But I'm saying that to be, if you want to be an independent person, which means you don't want to sign to a list of positions, if you want to be able to say, I will make the decision when the time comes, then you need the, the workshop, some of the things that could come out of a working group that we're talking about. We need to do real a movement out into the community to talk about how do you run, how do you reach people. And it's not about raising money. I really don't think, I don't think that this solves or deals with the problem. So although I don't think 250 is too high, I didn't think 500 was too high, I didn't think that that was the issue. And certainly nobody ever thought of offering me $1,000. I never received that in my whole political life. So I think we need to think about how do you get new people in by not focusing on this, but really moving into the community with some political workshops, which I think we need to do. Comments, yes, Kathy. Okay, uh, I like the way Evan 
ended his passionate plea that this is a first step and it could, could and should be combined with other things because it's what I said originally is I think the limit makes total sense for all sorts of reasons. It's just it, it isn't enough and it's not what made for su successful campaigns this time. Some people spent $500 on a website, um, huge amounts to help people massage voting lists. There's a way to lower that expense and then not need as much money. Um, some basic training, and I even thought when we went and did those videos, I've been on the public stage multiple times, so I did not freeze when they put me in a closet <laughs> looking at a, a gray wall <laughs> with a clock taken down, but a couple people just froze. And I was thinking, allow people two takes. You know, even when you do, you know, a movie mm -hmm. thing, it's not always the first take that works. I mean, there's just a few, these are not, costly, but we would have to do a concerted effort. So I would like, if we vote for a limit, I would like to be it also a vote for a limit as an initial step, and then really think of what else we could do and put our heads together. Steve. Yeah, so we all have anecdotes about how we got here. So, and that continues to be one of the problems that I'm having is that we only have 13 anecdotes. So we don't have the stories of everyone else out there. I have to say there's been complete 100% radio silence on this issue. There have been emails that have gone out to a number of voters asking them to contact their counselors about this issue. I got zero until today, Meg Gage, which went to everyone. So there seems to be a giant yawn, you know, out in the, you know, outside of these walls. I, in a way, I feel like we're talking about something very esoteric. So I, myself, got exact, the highest donation I got was 200. I was, um, I had this image that I go door to door with eight and a half by 11 flyers. And then we escalated up to yard signs and we escalated up to, you know, a whole bunch of stuff. So if we were to do something, it wouldn't be the campaign limits. Actually, I would do both campaign limits. And I know we can't limit yard signs. That's been tested elsewhere in Holyoke or, or somewhere. I did. But I would say, I think there's a whole bunch of uh, rules we could set up that can, those kinds of things are what are intimidating people. Like, so for me, this idea that I had to go get yard signs and put those, find out, you know, ask people to put them in their front yard and, you know, et cetera, that, those would be the things that I would love to limit. Shall we? So the reason there's a big yawn is very often the people that we want to engage are busy and are not able to, and I was able to get hold of four such people whose voices we heard, and all four of them unanimously wanted. And, and even though that's just four people, uh, what we also heard Mr. Bonifaz talk about is policy, and what I looked up, different policies that are recommending, it's not just our individual experiences, we're just 13 people, and we still are pretty privileged, most of us here. Uh, what what we need to look at is people who are actively studying this. And there are people in policy who are looking at how this affects. And when they are all recommending there should be, a, you know, there should be a limit, then I think we need to be paying attention and not just looking at, well, I went out and knocked on so many doors. And I sure did. You know, I did have the support of a PAC, but I went and knocked on hundreds and maybe thousand doors. I went door to door doing that, and that's what helped eventually. But it's not about what I did individually. What we're looking at is how this impacts people outside of the 13 people in this room. And so there are a couple of ways we can go about it. I think this is a good first step, and then we create a committee or working group that actively engages the community members that looks at policies and talks to people who are studying these policy and we create a holistic uh, strategy or policy for how to continue to move in that direction. Andy. I just have a couple of things. One is, this is hard, but I'm gonna say it anyway. Uh, I have been very pleased with this council over the period since we uh, got past our very beginning that we have really worked together as a group and had a lot of confidence in each other and have avoided having to go back into the divisiveness of the campaign. I've been very uncomfortable with this discussion because it has reopened a lot of the divisiveness that occurred and I was so 
pleased with us that we got beyond it, and I'm so saddened that we seem to have sunk back towards it by this discussion. The reason I am going to vote yes on the motion is uh, back to a question that I asked way back at the beginning, whether if we pass this tonight, it will have an impact on the upcoming election. And the answer was, barring the collection of signatures to uh, go through the, count, uh, the charter provision on veto, it will affect the elections that are coming up um, for library trustees and school committee. And it's a first step. It's our chance to um, try something different and uh, feel a little awkward being the ones who are trying something different on another group of candidates. But uh, on the other hand, I think that we've all spoken to the principles of why it's the right thing to do. Uh, yes, Pat. Um, I, I just want to confess that my largest donation was $300. It came from Kim Wainwright, who was a man in my dance company 40 years ago. Uh, it was a complete surprise since I haven't seen him except on Facebook. Um, but I did want to say uh, to Evan, um, you may be the only renter, but, uh, but there are homeowners on this council who don't have money. Um, and who are in a similar position or maybe even a worse position for you. Since I spent the weekend dealing with people's assumptions, I really want to clear that one away um, very strongly. And, and you can't assume that you're different um, because you have less money, because you're not. Um, and I can support this as a first step. I think that the fine is kind of ridiculous. Um, it's too small. Um, I would love to see the fine for breaking whatever we decide um, be higher and also include publication of people's names who've broken it. Uh, I think that's very important because what's, you know, $250 to me might not mean much. To you, it might mean a lot. Um, I think that we have to look at that before I can vote yes on this. Um, and I also think that we, if this is the first step, then there really does need to be a deep study because this is not going to level the playing field. Are there other comments at this time? Alyssa. So I'll try and read fast. So despite all the discussion of how to do this and how there are all these different agencies and people looking at this all over the world, all over the United States, we are the only municipality out of 351 that is doing this other than Northampton. I don't believe this is our chance to be in the front of this. I don't think this is a good use of our time. I don't think the devoting town council resources to this issue alone, as well as all the other really important issues, and I've talked about how I wish the league, we had something like a league that wasn't the league because the league can't do candidates. I totally support doing that outside of the town council's time. We have so much in front of us that I can't say this is more important than 50 other things that are on our list. I will also say that what we have done through this entire process, both here and at the previous thing, was making judgments about how people should campaign. If you as a voter think $1,000 is too much and you question why the candidate's taking that, are you also looking at whether or not they're purchasing their signs from out of state and delivering them here in a truck from 600 miles away? And are you looking at whether or not they got them done at a union shop locally? Also, perhaps, are you looking and considering that there's complete transparency in all of that reporting on the town website and has been for many years? Are you also requiring that every candidate has to knock doors, that that absolutely has to happen? What about when I was using a cane two years ago for eight weeks? Happened to be during campaign season. Oh, so I'm a bad candidate because I didn't knock doors. What if I have a permanent mobility issue? Oh, well, you should have knocked doors. I don't think it's our business to tell people how to campaign. I think it's our business to be incredibly transparent, and I think it's our business to offer people lots of opportunities to learn from us and from others as to how to campaign more cheaply and more efficiently. Darcy. I would also say that um, there really isn't a rush here. We don't have uh, an election for us in quite a while now. Um, so we wouldn't be able to see how this worked. And I feel like it's so important to include those other elements in whatever we do um, that it's worth waiting to look at some, 
you know, putting forward some kind of a study committee. Um, yes, basically that's. Mandy uh, Joe. Yeah. I'm sorry. Was there more? Okay. So there is an election. There is an election where people will be pulling papers in two weeks on July one. And that is for library trustees, six seats are up, and that is for school committee, and five seats are up. There is also Amherst Housing Authority and the Oliver Smith Will elector in that one too. But there is an election. Just because it's not our election doesn't mean it's not an important issue to do. Um, and I wanna just reiterate, I can never say it as eloquently as Evan said it, but first steps are important. It is so hard to get a comprehensive bill of anything passed because it takes so long to find it and then a lot of people find a little thing wrong with it, with some part of it and say, well, I can't vote for it at all. I agree, this is just a first step. This is not the be all end all of trying to find a way to level the playing field for council elections, for school committee elections, for library trustee elections, to get people that we want to be running for office to run for office individuals and it's not about what you can accept it's about the perception of when someone sees as as evan was saying wow someone can take a thousand dollars and my network couldn't have a single person donate more than 25 dollars there's no way i can compete i won't even enter that election and pull those papers if that's the type of perception we want, then vote against this. But that's not the perception I want in this town. I want a perception where someone who knows that they can only gain a $30 or $40 contribution because that's their network, that they look at the 250 limit and say, well, I can compete against that. I have a shot. And so I will take my chance and try it, even if they think they can't compete against 1,000. It's a first step. It's not the end. We don't have to stop here, but if we don't start somewhere, we might never get any of it done. So if you think this is a f good first step, and I've heard Steve say, well, it might not final at all, and so maybe I'll vote against it, but he said it's a good first step. So if it's a good first step and something good, vote for this, let's get it started, and let's figure out who else wants to tackle this and see if we can come up with some more solutions. Unless I hear other comments, I'd like to call a question. Yeah, I just Steve. need to clarify. I don't think I ever said it's a good first step. I think that I've been against it pretty much 100%. Thank you. Also, we have to, there are, there are at least two candidates for town council that raised zero, that, that as far as I know had, so you can run for town council with, with zero. Dorothy. I think if the public is listening to this, they think that they can't run without money because that's all we've talked about. My husband ran successfully for library trustee. I don't think he spent a nickel. Um, money is not really the issue. And my objections to this, it's not about money. It's about um, other ways of getting people's name known out there and how trying to make a level playing field and that this does not address it. Darcy. And I would just say that, um, you know, I, I don't actually don't feel like this is a good first step, that we should be doing all of our steps together to make sure that we have Your mic, please. Pardon? Your mic. Oh, sorry. Um, we need to be doing them all simultaneously in order to, to level the playing field. And if we don't, we actually set up a situation that is unfair because it, adva it advantages people who are supported by the PAC if we put in limits to finance, campaign finance. Here, Pat. I think it uh, favors people who already have money. Um, and that, I, it's on, I'm just not close enough. Um, I also heard Andy's criticism of the, you, the PAC, the not PAC, blah, blah, blah. Um, I w <laughs> not that it's a blah, blah, blah. It's an important issue. I don't understand, and Catherine, I think, knows this from me. I don't understand why we have a PAC in Amherst. I really don't. I understand why we have collections of citizens who work together um, to do different things. Um, and I, but, so I would like to eliminate the PAC, the not PAC, 
from our conversation. But this does not address the differences in personal finances and the impact that has on our elections. So. Are there further comments at this time? Then I call the question. All those in favor of the limitation on can campaign contributions as presented, both this and the next page, if you would. Okay. Please raise your hand and state aye. 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 Opposed? It's a tie vote, it fails. I would like to say that if some of the issues were addressed uh, in a rewrite, I would be more favorable, including the fine and penalties for breaking it. Thank you. Let's move on to the next agenda item. Thank you. Uh, the next agenda item is the Community Resource Committee Amendment. Uh, I actually put this on here because uh, there was a discussion as to whether or not community resources wanted to look to expand their membership. That was initially caused because one member had stepped down. It turns out that member has uh, now been asked to be reinstated, so uh, Sarah is going to be on CRC. However, this is the Community Resource Committee um, charge, and if the Community Resource Committee would like to look at their charge, we have left that open for all committees to do. I don't know that this even requires a referral. Okay. No? Okay. Uh, then we're going to move on to I, which is accept the deed to the Krishik property located on well, Shootsbury Road. Not the roll call votes, H. Oh, I'm sorry, thank you. We need to do the quick roll call votes. This is the mopping up of our previous uh, work. And so the first one is um, these are roll call votes on prior to FY 2000, I mean, FY 20 budget approvals. The first one is the regional school district. Motion one was voted 12 to zero with one member absent on, that was Andy Steinberg on April 22nd, 2019. I think I have clarified that, the, however, that does not prevent Mr. Steinberg from voting this time, okay? So the motion, and I would like somebody to make this motion, is I move that the town council approve the Amherst Pelham Regional School District operating and capital budget of $32,167,342 and that the town raise the appropriate $16,444,279 as its share of that budget. Is there a motion? Pat, second. And it's a roll call. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Baumilne? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Uh, it's 12 to 0, unanimous by roll call vote, one member absent. Okay. The next motion. Uh, motion 2 was voted 12-0 with one member absent. That was also, that was Andy Steinberg um, on April 22nd, 2019 and was amended as shown below, but a unanimous vote on May 6th. The motion is as follow. I move that the town vote to amend section six of the Amherst Pelham Regional School District Agreement by adding subsection J as follows. For fiscal year 2020 only, the alternate operating um, budget assessment shall be calculated 
as 30% of the five-year average of minimum contributions with remainder of the assessment allocated to the member towns in accordance with the per-pupil method found in Section 6E of the Amherst Regional School District, uh, Amherst Pelham Regional School District Agreement. The five-year average of minimum contributions will include the five most recent years. Is there a motion? Pam? I so move. Second. Second. That was George. Um, any further discussion? I would, we don't need that. Roll call vote, please. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. The vote is 12 to 0 with one member absent. That was a roll call vote. Okay. And the final one is was voted uh, on June 3rd, just at our last meeting, with 12 to 0 with one member absent. And the motion is to adopt appropriation and transfer order fiscal year 20-04 and order appropriating the town of Amherst FY 2020 operating budget as recommended by the Finance Committee and shown on pages 10 and 11 of the document entitled Town Council Finance Committee Recommendations on Fiscal Year 2020 Budget. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. I second. Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. The vote is 12 to 0, roll call, one member absent. Okay. We're ready to move on to the next item, which is to the accept the deed to the Krushek property. Mr. Yes. <laughs> assistant Town Manager, excuse me. Good evening. Dave Zomack, Assistant Town Manager. I'm uh, pinch hitting tonight for Mr. Mooring. Happy to answer any of your questions on this project. Um, I was before you back on April 20th. You may recall um, that this is a property uh, on the Shutesbury. It, it, it is a property uh, that has land both in Shutesbury and Pelham. And back on April 17th, I believe at your meeting, or April 20th, I'm sorry, um, you um, authorized the submittal of a grant agreement for reimbursement through DEP. So we are purchasing a piece of property that has been deemed uh, critical to protecting our water supply on the pelham Shutesbury line, and we are receiving a 50% reimbursement from the state to do so. So one of the final steps in that process is for you to accept the deed. You are the water commissioners for the town of Amherst, and um, that is your official role to accept the deed. We will then move forward to purchase the land all of this is a little bit, um, uh, we're, we're pressed on this because DEP has a very um, inflexible uh, process and we apologize that this has moved through, so quickly through that, um, but DEP has their regulations and we need to follow them. So uh, we would ask tonight that you vote to accept the deed for the property and DPW staff will follow through uh, and close on the property as soon as possible. The total purchase price is, um, refreshing my own memory and, and yours, the total purchase is $82,600, and the town will reimburse us 51% of that, that is $41,300. So our outlay from the water fund is forty-one three, and that includes the purchase price plus some incidental costs. It may be surveying or appraisal or something like that. Um, and this is all done by appraisal. That's how we arrive at the number. So happy to take your questions. Yeah, are there questions? Yes, Dorothy. I just have a brief comment. Uh, thanking you and the town of Amherst for being proactive in pr preserving our water. Thank you. I'll pass that along to Mr. Mooring and uh, Amy Rusecki, who is, is uh, the, the staff person as assistant um, superintendent of public works. Who, who really moves these forward, and Mr. Bachelman and I are happy to support them any way we can. But um, it is their their role, and they do a great job doing it. So. Okay. Other yes, Andy. 
So I have two quick questions. One is um, in the item that was in the uh, packet, which is the quick claim deed under 7i, it gives the consideration listed as 81,000 as a um, even amount. And so I was a little confused by the number you gave as being different from the number in the quick claim deed. The other question, since I'll get them both out, is does, um, is there a reason why we don't need an appropriation and transfer order to transfer money from uh, the enterprise fund in addition to approving the deed? Let's begin with the first question. So I'm going to go with I'm going to go with what is in the deed, um, which is for the eighty-one thousand. Okay. Um, and then the question is, do we need? an appropriation that I may hunt to Mr. Bachelman. I don't know the answer exactly, but I believe that the town had appropriated funds previously for purchase. Uh, the a town meeting had appropriated funds uh, in prior years to purchase land, and this would be coming out of that fund. I think it's like two hundred thousand dollars that was set aside by town meeting. Did didn't our April 22nd vote include to appropriate some money? Margaret. On April 22nd, the council did vote to appropriate the money. This is, this is simply the acceptance of the deed. Thank you. So we've already done the appropriation. So your question was, yes, we have to do that, and we did it. OK. <laughs> Thank you. Um, are there any other questions? Can I just yes. clarify, I'm just looking at the memo that Mr. Mooring or uh, it was from Amy Rusecki back on April 17th, and the amount was 82.6. So I did not have anything to do with drafting the, quid, the deed. Um, so I think your vote, uh, I'm looking again to, to Mr. Bachman and, and uh, so I'm, I'm inclined to go with the larger figure. Uh, we can always you yes. know, change the deed, but I, I, I think your vote should, should reflect what the total project amount back on April 20th, which was 82.6. Which was the amount we voted for the yes. appropriation. Yes. Okay. And I, I appreciate Andy's comment about yeah. the deed. I think there may be an inconsistency with that, the deed, the way it's drafted. Right, so this is just acceptance of the deed. Right. We're not, it's not the appropriation. Right. Mm -hmm. so. And I, I, I would clarify further that 81000 is the purchase price. Anything additional was um, associated costs. So what you did on Seven. April 20th was the full 826. This is just for the purchase price. So yeah. I think that speaks to Mr. Steinberg's yeah. I mean, uh, when question. you buy property, there's usually, usually settlement costs. Right, and but that's in fact, what the deed, I think, is correct at 81. That is the purchase price. Okay. All the other costs are associated, and those may be paid for through the water fund, but they wouldn't be paid to the individual. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. Are there any other questions? Okay. The motion, then, that I need is move on this 17th day of June 2019 that the town of Amherst acting by and through its town council as the Board of Water Commissioners hereby accepts the foregoing deed to property located on Shutesbury Road in Pelham and partly in Shutesbury for water supply protection pursuant to general law C40, SS38, 39B, and 41, and Article 97 of the Amendments of the Massachusetts Constitution, and authorizes the Town Council President to execute the town council's acceptance of the deed on behalf of the town. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Is there a second? Second. Further questions? All those in favor, raise your hand and say aye. 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 Is opposed? Abstain. 12-0 with one absent. 12-0-0 with one absent. Thank you very much. Thank you. Don't go away. Uh, okay, we're moving on to appointments, and we're going to try to get back on schedule. Uh, appointments, uh, this is a report forwarded from the town manager 
through OCA, and uh, it is regarding the Conservation Commission. Is there any comment from OCA at this time? Yes, Evan. So OCA considered the town manager uh, recommended appointees to the Conservation Commission at our meeting last week. Uh, it was a really great meeting that we had with the town manager present. Uh, OCA is continuing to have conversations with the town manager about what sorts of information uh, we hope to see uh, accompanying his, uh, his appointments. Um, and that conversation really started uh, in full force, I think, with the Conservation Commission um, with the absence of some information for one of the uh, uh, appointees, um, but we were able to get that information during the deliberation that we had, um, and so we recommended approval of the town manager appointees to Conservation Commission. Is there a question from the council? All right, then Evan, I'm going to read the motion and ask you to move it to confirm the town manager's appointments to the Conservation Commission effective July 1st, 2019, as recommended by the Outreach, Communication, and Appointments Committee for three-year terms expiring June 30th, 2022. Anna Devlin Gothier, Casey Joe DeFries, DeFresne, uh, and Laura Pagliarulo for a two-year term to expire June 30th, 2021, Lawrence Ambs and Brett Butler. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Any further discussion? Yes, Alyssa? I just need to, um, as we continue to refine our process here, we have always in the past in our motions, I mean, always in our past before town council, always included whether or not someone was a reappointment in the motion and Brett Butler in this case is a reappointment and that should be reflected in the motion, not merely by going and reading the report later to find that out. I um, also have a question that the town manager can probably answer off the top of his head or perhaps Evan can because I just noticed it now, even though I've read this report like three times, is that the three-year terms say effective July 1 or upon approval in some cases. The two-year term, uh, what? They're both I, effective July I, 1. I believe the, those were vacancies. So they're, they're either July 1 or upon approval because those two represent vacancies, whereas the other two do not. So I guess I don't understand. There's reappointments, there's vacancies, there's a third thing? So there are two vacancies right now on the Conservation Commission. So uh, there are other terms that expire on July 1. So I'm recommending that Anna Devlin Gothier and Laura Pagliar Rulo become effect effective upon your vote because they're va they're, they're no, there's nobody sitting in there. There have been resignations, exactly. Okay, let's make sure we get this motion correct. So it's Anna and Laura are to be effective immediately. And Casey is to be effective July 1, and Lawrence and Brett are July 1. Okay. Uh, Margaret, do you want to try to read a cleaned up motion? I mean, I can try if you would like, but. to confirm the town manager's appointments to the Conservation Commission effective July 1, 2019, or immediately as noted, and we'll be sure to put immediately next to Anna Gothier and Laura Pegliarulo, um, as recommended by the Outreach Communications and Appointments Committee. Next to Brett Butler's name will be a reappointment. Are there questions? Uh, do you accept that friendly amendment? Yes. George? Thank you. Any further questions? If not, all those in favor, raise your hand by, and say aye. 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 Opposed? A abstain? Looks like it was 12001 missing. Okay, we're going on to committee reports, most of which I assume are going to be brief since many of the items tonight were in fact reports of committees. 
but let's see where we are. Okay. Uh, audit committee, anything, Pat? No, we will become active in August, at the end of August. All right. Bylaw review committee, I believe we've already heard that. Is there anything else? Uh, community resources committee. Community resources committee met last Wednesday. We talked about um, goals, continued discussion of, of goals, but the primary thing that we talked about was the public, I'm sorry, the percent for art proposal. So we met with the two proposers who's, who also had met with the council and we had a robust discussion. There are a lot of parts to this and I think that the conclusion that our committee came up with is, remember, I, <laughs> is that there should be a work group of some kind that can work with the proposers. So perhaps representatives from the CRC, from the finance committee, the other group that it was referred to, the proposers and maybe someone from the town manager's office, but we saw it as too big for the CRC to make recommendations at this point. Okay. Anything else regarding CRC? Okay. Uh, the goals at HOC committee, we are not scheduled to meet again until the middle of July. Finance committee, Andy, anything additional? No, I don't think there's anything additional. And when are, when are we taking up one per, the one half percent for art? We will, um, at our next meeting, it is on the agenda. Um, I do not anticipate a, that we will have much time for discussion. Mm -hmm. We will probably be using the opportunity only to talk about what our process will be going forward. Uh, I think that the remaining Community Preservation Act proposal will probably take a larger part of the time for the meeting. Thank you. Um, anything else from finance? No. no. Okay. Uh, GOL, Mandy Joe. Nothing right now. We'll have a written report for next meeting. Okay. Oka, anything from Alyssa or Evan? I can, we can just report that we'll have a lot of, we, we hope to have a lot of town manager appointments for July 1st. And so some of those you've already seen because they've been filed. Some of those haven't been filed yet, but we know he has them in process. So it's just the time of year that's super busy for that sort of thing. We'll be meeting consistently every week until we get that done. Thank you. Did, yes. One thing, um, since we don't have a written report this week, is that last week we did have a joint meeting with the resident advisory committee. Um, to discuss sort of the shared challenges that we have since uh, we're two separate committees with two very different charges, but we face a lot of the same hurdles, and uh, that was a really interesting conversation. Can I just also ask the uh, resident appointments to the Finance Committee, will those be coming to us on July 1st, or will they be coming to us later than that? Uh, we began uh, deliberation around the OCA designees recommended appointees today. We did not finish that deliberation, uh, so that will continue on June 24th. Uh, so should there be a vote on June 24th, then I would anticipate that they would be to the full council by, by July 1. Thank you. Um, so we're going to question, yes. Dorothy. Just one, one other thing, the outreach subcommittee of the OCA committee is going to be sending out a Google form to all of you about the types of outreach that we're all doing um, so that we can share it with each other. So expect that shortly. Great. Thank you. Uh, any further comments on committees at this time? Okay, we're moving to approval of minutes. Uh, we're approving minutes for May 28th, 2019, June 3rd, 2019, and two sets for June 10th, 2019. Is there any motion? Okay. I move, I move I'm to approve. Move to approve the May 28th, 2019, June 3rd, 2019, and June 10th, 2019, both sets. Town Council meeting minutes. Um, Oh, I see the way it's written, I'm sorry. Uh, 
June 10th, 2019 Town Council Meeting Minutes and June 10th, 2019 Capital Improvement Program Forum Minutes as presented. Is there a motion, George? A second, Dorothy? I second it. Any uh, changes, amendments, additions, corrections? Okay, all those in favor say aye by raising your hand and saying aye. 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 Opposed? Abstain. Okay. So it's 10, 10, two, 10, zero, two, one absent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, town manager's report. Mr. Bachman. Thank you. Um, since you've talked a little bit about your Google form, which is exciting, that um, our community participation officers continue to reach into the community and they, their paths are crossing with many town councilors who are showing up at many of the same events, which is really a terrific thing. I think you're also seeing that LSSC has made a special effort to be in the community as well and with doing uh, things at Olympia Oaks and Butternut Farms and things like that. So that's a really good way to connect with people in an informal way. And the community participation officers and the community members who are attending really appreciate when the counselors show up. They, they really feel that, that uh, there's a nice connection there and they appreciate that a lot. Um, some th work that's happening in town is um, Eversource is, will be, re uh, there's a high tension, high power line that goes through Amherst. Uh, they are replacing those sort of, the poles, the, the um, sort of, uh, material that holds up the, uh, the, the high tension wires and they're gonna replace them with singular poles. This is going to be starting in July. It will go through probably December. They uh, basically go door to door to people if they have to cross their property. There will be no interruption of uh, electricity in the town. This is just to upgrade their service uh, that moves uh, power through the town. Um, the, uh, other work that's happening is um, Station Road. So tomorrow morning, uh, the DPW will be there bright and early removing, um, uh, installing the final signs and removing um, coverings of uh, signs. So tomorrow morning at 8 a.m., uh, I'm sorry, did I say Station Road? I meant State Street. State Street will become one way. Uh, sorry, folks. Got our attention there. Got your, got your attention, yeah. We'll be back, I'll be back to Station Road in a second. State Street will become one way. Um, and, uh, and so that will happen at 8 a.m. tomorrow. There'll be police officers on duty throughout the week to help guide people from uh, uh, Lever Road, yeah, Lever Road at that point, and uh, at um, uh, Mill Street to help uh, guide people. I think the weather's supposed to be not so great. It's supposed to be overcast, so it won't be really crowded. Um, but it'll be an educational process, and that's the way we will do enforcement, is to help people educate. The key thing is that if you, you can come down State Street from Leverett Road, but then you can't f go all the way through to, to Mill Street. Once you get underneath the railroad trestle, you'll have to turn around and go back out. So uh, we think that that's going to increase public safety increase the ability of public safety vehicles to get uh, to Puffer's Pond if there is an emergency, uh, make it safer, safer for pedestrians and bicyclists to uh, travel on State Street and um, hopefully rationalize the parking. There will be a reduction in parking, unfortunately, but that is part of the, that's the only way we could handle this. Uh, Station Road, uh, work is continuing on Station Road. They're out there today working as well. Um, the you know the bridge is on the side of the road waiting to be installed. Uh, they are they've been pouring concrete. The concrete will have to um, uh, age until it, it can can handle the load that would be placed on it, and then we'll be moving forward. There's still some calculations that the state has to uh, approve that we have provided to them. Uh, we talked with at the um, ribbon cutting for the Mill Street Bridge. We talked with the uh, folks from the Department of Transportation. They're totally aware of where we are on the Station Road Bridge, so we think that that will continue to move forward. Um, uh, Independence Day is coming up July 4th, and there will be fireworks. Uh, 
by the UMass uh, Stadium, but it's going to be different than, there, than it has been in the past because UMass is doing construction. You will still park in the same location, but you'll have to walk in front of the stadium to the other side of the stadium, uh, where, which is where the fireworks and where the big field will be and where fireworks will take place. The, um, we're looking at having a, um, a tent where you can buy beer that would be located, it would be in the town of Hadley, but it's one way to help us generate the funds that we need to cover the cost of this. And um, so I had to make sure everyone was aware of that as well. Um, I want to mention, uh, what else? Oh, um, we'll, we've been talking a lot about safety, especially after the shooting in Vir Virginia Beach. And I've talked with the president uh, of the council, who's talked about safety in this room uh, during your meetings and at other times as well, and expressed concern about what are the options. We do have um, police officers who are trained in uh, threat assessments and response. We're looking at our schedules to try and figure out a time when the council is able to meet with them, meet with our police officers to go through what the protocols would be, what the options would be, and what physical changes we could make to the building uh, for our staff, but also for people in public meetings as well. Um, short of having a, um, a police officer stationed here, although if the, if the council or the president ever feels that there is a need for a police officer, we would certainly have one here if there's a, a contentious issue that you perceived might be, become a problem. Uh, we, it's not uncommon for the town to have uh, people in town hall who are um, agitated for one reason or another. We, find, we feel very comfortable that the police are literally about 90 seconds away. Uh, it's, uh, so we call them when we need it and they are here instantaneously. Uh, and the council should feel the same safety. but. Also, just what would happen and walk through some of the scenarios. We've done this for town staff. Uh, we're going to be doing it for the Bang Center as well. Um, it's not a happy thing that we have to do it, but we do have people who have been trained in what's called ALICE training, so we'd like to offer that to the council as well. Um, I will be sending a memo to appoint uh, Sue Adet, who is the assistant town clerk, uh, to be the temporary town clerk as we search for a new town clerk. Uh, under the charter that I'm allowed to do that for about 150 days, I think is the maximum. It shouldn't take that long uh, for a new town clerk, but we will be embarking on a search for a new town clerk uh, as well. And then um, lastly, uh, went to um, attended Nancy Pagano's farewell on Friday, which was attended by I don't know, 120 people, uh, lots of speeches and things like that. Uh, she has served the town for 47 years, the longest anyone has ever served the town in continuous full-time employment, which is a remarkable um, uh, accomplishment for her. And uh, we are, and so just want to congratulate Nancy on her uh, retirement, which is well-earned and well-deserved. And she's been just a mainstay. It's gonna be really hard for people who are used to being in the senior center to feel like, oh, Nancy's not the director anymore. We are in the search process for a new director, and we're closing in on that. Hope to have an announcement pretty soon um, to be able to relate to the council. So. Okay. Okay, moving on to councilor comments. Um, yes, I'm sorry, is there a question? question about the town manager? Uh, thank you very it? much. Go ahead. Um, so in regards to, as it, as it says here in the section on human resources, appointing Sue Audette, and thank you for pointing that out to us. But as we know, Margaret is leaving us, and she's also serving as the clerk of the council, as it says in the report, and we haven't had a discussion about what that looks like. So are we going to I have that I have that in my comments. Wonderful. Thank you. Yes. A question for the town manager. Uh, so the last several reports have essentially said the same thing on the E Street School RFP. Um, I'm wondering if there's any more specificity you could give as to where that is in the process of the RFP becoming something that would actually be released. Yeah, so uh, I talked with, uh, it's, it's between the trust and the procurement officer and the planning department, and they, I talked with Nate Loy, he thought it would be ready by mid-July to go out. Yes, Dorothy. Um, in terms of um, parking near uh, Puffer's Pond, Somehow you've got to find some more parking uh, 
for people whose only way to get there would be to drive. I do understand why you're changing the street. It, it totally was unsafe without that change. But I, somehow locate some parking which people can be informed of where they could park legally then, and still get a de not too, deep, too big a walk to the pond. That's a challenge because we don't own property where that um, is easily done. We, people can park at Mill Street um, Recreation Area and walk uh, through the woods to get to the, to the uh, pond that way. That's, a, that's for, for many people, that's a, a fun walk. Um, you can also, I mean, you can walk at, Cush you can park near Cushman and walk through the woods to go there. That, a lot of people do that as well. Um, there's handicap parking that's available on, you know, very adjacent to the pond. But I think the Puffer Pond 2020 study had, had identified the need for additional parking and we have not prioritized that as terms of providing funds for that. We've been having internal discussions about how do we generate more funds because it's not just town residents who use Puffer's Pond. There's a lot of other people who use it and we're trying to figure out a way that where it could generate some revenue that would both uh, help support uh, more oversight of the area in terms of uh, uh, patrols or things like that, but also to generate some income to be able to create parking and things like that up there. Are there additional questions of the town manager at this point? Okay. So, last Friday, on my various trips up and down 116, I think I must have made about three or four, Andy and I were presented with, <laughs> with this sign by the students at the Lending Library Ribbon Cutting at uh -huh. the, um, nice. for, um, the Crocker Farm bus stop. Mm -hmm. And if you have a chance to drive by and see that, it was really lots of fun. Uh, and they totally appreciated having us show up. They even had a sign for us. Mm -hmm. um, the town council retreat is, is in fact uh, scheduled for September 21st uh, from nine to two, the location to be determined. There is a special town meeting on August 19th. Uh, and also on the 26th council meeting. Council meeting. Uh, the one on August 19th will begin at five o'clock and that is when we will begin the process of doing the town evaluation, town manager's evaluation. Speaking of that, let me just state, there has been an initial delay, but it will not affect the final timeline. And that is because we are converting the town council and the employee survey to an electronic tool called SurveyMonkey. This will allow employees to ensure anonymity of their responses and allows us, however, to compile the responses by departments. And uh, in, at the same time, when counselors answer theirs, we'll still be able to sort them out and publish them by council responses, but again, it will aggregate the responses, taking away some of the tedium of putting the proposal together. I expect both of those to be going out this week. Uh, any questions on that? Okay. Clerk of the Council, uh, according to Charter Section 6.2b, a notice of a vacancy has been posted for the position of Clerk of the Council. Uh, should we need an interim appointment, Section 33.3b allows the Town Manager to appoint someone on a temporary basis. However, it is my intention to bring a recommendation regarding appointment of the Clerk of the Council to you at our July 1st meeting. Questions? Which of the two August Town Meetings starts at 5? I'm sorry, going back to that, August 19th. August 19th. Okay. Yes. Are we going it? to get any written information prior to July 1st about, since just this is our first chance at doing this, another new thing we've I, done? I'm, I hope to have both the job description as well as a motion, and then after that, the town manager would need to um, basically make sure that our wishes are carried out. Yes. I'm not still clear. Are we still doing uh, sharing with the town? Are we doing that? Yeah. Yes. In fact, the if you look at the budget, yeah. are we sharing with who? The the town with the the town council clerk with the town clerk. 
No, is it not, the same no not necessarily at all. But we are still having somebody from the town who will be part-time for the council. As well as looking at ways to accommodate for minutes, et cetera. Trying to take into consideration all the things we've heard but not break the budget. Do you have an additional question, Shalini? <laughs> it's what's on everyone's mind. I'm sorry? I think that question is on everyone's mind. It's on everyone's mind, believe me. <laughs> I've been trying to push this one as far as we can. And then we realized, again, according to the charter, we had to post an announcement. OK. Um, are there future agenda items? Councilor comments? Uh, we have been asked by the topics not reasonably anticipated by the President 48 hours in advance to discuss the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission appointments. And I think I've tried to sort through a bunch of stuff, more emails than I've gotten on a lot of things. At this point, the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission recognizes as our regular commissioner, Jack Jemsek of the Planning Board, okay? And the, um, actually the select board appointed Christine Gray Mullen as the alternate a couple years ago, okay? The new Mass General Law, or the Mass General Law about all of this says that a planning board member should be the original commissioner, but the alternate is appointed by the town manager. So in an attempt to kind of clean this up, and the reason this has come up is because Tim Brennan, longtime executive director of Pioneer Valley Planning Commission is retiring and the two finalist candidates are being interviewed on Thursday, uh, the June 27th. Um, I've asked the planning board who is meeting on the 20th to vote their representative, whether it's to reaffirm uh, Jack Jemsek or whatever, that's their vote and we will then also ask the town manager to proceed with an appointment. Are there questions? Steve. Yeah, so um, this is of great concern to me because I used to be the PVPC rep when I was on the planning board and for a very long time, Amherst used its two slots, one for the planning board and the other one for the select board. And that, w so the PVPC, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, has many roles in <laughs> Hamden and Hampshire counties. So one is it's kind of a de facto planning st staff for those towns that are too small to have planning staff. It provides some planning services, but more importantly, it does a lot of big things that, you know, believe it or not, you know, they affect our lives. So one is they were major advocates for the relocation of the Amtrak line from one side to the other. And that happened at a time that Amherst wasn't really paying attention to the PVC, PVC. And so that's about when I stepped on. And, and um, that was very frustrating. It probably still would have happened, but we lost our, you know, we lost our lights. So I came to realize that um, with the change in government, I knew that Connie Kruger was the select board rep, but we, the town council, I guess I assumed that there would be a town council rep. So the, really the, how I understood it is that Jack Jemsek was the planning board rep, Connie Kruger was the alternate. This being Amherst, Christine Gray Mullen also wanted to serve, so she, they, they made her a second alternate. So really she was the alternate to, so, so the idea would be that she and Jack would split the position, but then Connie would also attend. So I guess I'm really concerned that, you know, it's been six months since the change of government I have no clue what the PVC is up to. So um, it's impossible to find their minutes online. Um, they're written in the report because uh, we 
we don't have a rep on the PVC, PC, therefore there is no report to the town council. The, we're coming in, you know, the CRC is coming online. That'll be a reasonable conduit to it. So that, that's of great concern. So, so the other thing I did ask is that uh, the planning board with Mr. Jemsek provide us a with a yeah. report that will be included in our July 1st yep. Yep. Uh, minutes. Sure. I've also been able to confirm that they he regularly attends the meetings yep. as a commissioner, as yep. and I believe that Christine Gray Mellon does as well. So I not and and the way that it is set up is that until they are replaced, they are considered commissioners. So we have continued to be represented. I think the question now comes to how do we want to move yeah. forward? But so, so it, we do have to look at Chapter 40B, uh, Section 4, for guidance for that. So if I may, um, at the time of the change of government, the, the official roster of Amherst representation to, to the PVPC, Jack Chemsek, and Jack has the planning board reorganizes every year. They, he does get elected. So they had Jack Chemsek, this is on their roster, as the Amherst rep, Connie Kruger as the alternate, and then Christine Gray Mullen also as an alternate. I don't understand why when Connie Kruger, she must have resigned, why that didn't become vacant, and then why we didn't then have a discussion about who should be filling Connie's slot. So there was no discussion that then Christine moves up to the only alternate. So I find that really, you know, I find that very frustrating. And I don't think, you know, I know that a lot of communities have two planning board reps as their reps, but we're a community that the town council is just coming, you know, we're fighting our way. And I think that it's appropriate to have a town council rep on there because, in part because the PVVC deals with issues of, of model law, of um, matters that are of interest to the planning board, but also of interest to the legislative side. So, so you agree that the planning board appoints the, the oh, yeah. representative. And it's clueless to me as to why we would have had two alternates, because you're only allowed one. I know the backstory, but it's not. It's, it's that. It's too complicated to explain, but the official, to my understanding is that Jack Chemsick was the main commissioner and Connie Kruger was the alternate. And then Christine was there just in case the other two could not, could not be there. Okay, yes. This is Amherst. Mr. Bachelman. <laughs> so yeah, Ms. Kruger said, she, uh, Ms. Kruger resigned when, she, when her term ended in December. Um, at that point we had Mr. Jemsek who was a, the member and then we did ha we had a second alternate who was Christine Gray Mullen and that's what the PVPC has as their current roster. You're right, it, it is it's my responsibility to appoint someone and it can be a counselor, it can be someone else, it can be a planning director, it could be lots of different people. Um, so, but it is ultimately a responsibility and I understand, I'm taking into, I hear your concerns about having two planning board members and maybe it's broad, better to have a broader representation uh, on the PVPC, so I, I can follow up on that, that. But I realize that that's my responsibility. It wasn't a high priority for appointments because we had a person there and an alternate. Um, but it did come, it becomes more important when you're appointing the new director uh, for the PVPC. Okay. Further comments or questions? Yes, Mandy Jo. So I guess um, I would only want to mention one other thing. It sounds like by reading the law that it is the town manager's appointment at a minimum, but if you read the charter, um, section 3.2R, um, it, um, so it says unless otherwise provided by intermunicipal or regional agreement, measure, or general law, the manager shall service, service the town's liaison to any regional entity of which the town is a member and explore opportunities for intergovernmental cooperation. So I don't know how that fits into chapter 40B, section four, in terms of how the town manager appoints a alternate, because you could potentially read that to see, to say the town manager is the alternate. Um, so I don't know why that, that should be dis figured out before I think we have any further discussion maybe at the council as to what to do, but. So I, I do have section 40B's 
um, Chapter 40B, Section 4, the statement reads, there may be an alternate designee who may or may not be a planning board member who shall be a resident of the city or town he represents, appointed annually and certified in writing to the district planning commission by the mayor in a city, confirmed by the council, or in the case of a city with the plan E form of government, appointed annually by the city manager, or in a town by the selectmen, or in towns with manager form of government by the town manager who may attend meetings of the District Planning Commission and who shall assume the rights and duties of the planning board member in his absence. The alternative designee shall be named in writing to the District Planning Commission annually in order that he may perform the duties and exercise the powers authorized in this section. So based on state law, I read it, the, the town manager can do it or can appoint someone. Yes, Alyssa trying to keep track of three things I want to say about this because I know we're in a hurry. So I actually disagree. I think that the way this is written is actually different than the way most MGLs are written about what cities and towns do. We are none of these things. We are literally none of the things that are listed in the MGL because they don't just say city or town. They do all this goofy stuff like plan E this, and city that. So I would argue that there is something to be said for what the charter says associated with it, so then we should have legal counsel look at them side by side rather than making an assumption here. The reason the select board did it in the past is because we were told to do it, not because somebody had actually read the law and told us the right thing to do. So that happens. Um, and the other thing is associated with that, I was very grateful to hear that Pioneer Valley Planning Commission said that both our people are you know, certified as being the people who can vote, because I wanted to make sure they didn't show up that night to vote on like the biggest decision they've made in a while. And then they say, ah, now we, forget, we don't have your paperwork. So that was my concern when I started asking this question. However, again, MGL doesn't say anything about alternates being able to continue until they're replaced. It says that for the main person. It doesn't say that for the alternate. So Pioneer Valley Planning Commission wants to certify, I'm fine with that, so we got our two votes. but. That's not what it actually says. So I think we need a little more sorting out of this. But my other concern, my main concern was I wasn't going to hear later, oh, Amherst didn't show up to vote right. for the replacement. Right. Okay, good. We got that covered. And we, we so that we can vote. My other concern is what Steve was talking about, even though both of us didn't know the other one was working on this, which is how to make that connection between what the planning board does, Pioneer Valley Planning Commission, and what we do here, and the fact that we wouldn't normally get a report, and CRC right. may well be a cool way. So thank you for asking them to give us a report. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I think we'll start with that in further conversations. Okay? Any further discussion on this? Steve, thank you for bringing it, and Chris, and also Alyssa, for bringing this to our attention. Um, we, any further comment at this time before we move into executive session? Okay, then I'm going to read the motion to somebody make it that the town council meet in executive session pursuant to the provision of Mass General Law, C30A, Section 21A6, to discuss the purchase, exchange, lease, or value of real property. If the chair declares that the open, an open meeting will have a detrimental impact on the negotiation negotiating position of the public body and Mass General Law C30A Section 21A7 to comply with or act under authority of any general or special law or federal grant and aid requirements. Is there a, a motion? So moved. Second. And we will not return to open session. Thank you very much. We have to Oops. roll call vote. Oh, we have to take a roll call vote to go into executive session. Margaret? Say, who do we start with this time? <laughs> uh, Councillor Haneke? Yes. Councillor Pam? Yes. Councillor Ross? Yes. Councillor Ryan? Yes. Councillor Shane? Yes. Councillor Schreiber? Yes. Councillor Steinberg? Yes. Councillor Baumill? Yes. Councillor Brewer? Yes. Councillor DeAngelis? Yes. Councillor Dumont? Yes. Councillor Griesmer? Yes. 12 zero, zero. One absent. Thank you.